pa 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 pa. Okay, should be live. All right, I'll check it in a second. Check your internet connection or go to the stream control panel. What? It's not showing up. Oh wait, no, it might. It might be. No, oh wait, just... do we have a do we have a thumbnail? Uh, no. How does that work? <laughs> we need to make a thumbnail, probably. Actually, we can just like go live. Well, we 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 need to be on for like the first like fifteen minutes anyway, so like let people go on. So we're just we're live now. Does it work? All right, now? we're live. Let's let me see. Hey. Actually, let's uh, is Nick Brand here? No, never mind. I gotta say it for a second. <laughs> I gotta say Make a thumbnail. Aren't you like good at computer stuff? I don't know how it works. <laughs> uh, oh, never mind. Oh, I just got some last minute guest speakers, I think. Oh, wow. We might have actually two people at once. Okay. I might have to like Q you, you, one of these people. Crazy. Hmm. Edit title and description. That's fine. Do you want the link? Sure, that'd be great. Whoa, it makes cool beeping sounds in my ears. Can you hear this? Is so weird. Josh, I'm not used to this. <laughs> Josh. That's the weird feeling. All right, we have one person watching right now, and that person is me. And me. Cool. So then we have. Two people watching now. Let's go. Here, let me leave a like immediately. Actually, let me switch to my right account. There we go. Three people watching now. Whoa. Whoa, you have the yop and the thing switched up. That's cool. All right, so who do we have that want to join in? Create a title. Ryan. Who's Ryan? I might restart the stream. <clears throat> so you will. Wait, what? Why? Because I don't distribute that link yet. Okay. Wait, why are you restarting the stream? I might. I'm just trying to figure out if I can do this. Uh, no, it's not made for kids. Sure, it's made for kids. Uh, whatever. We can say no, it's not made for kids, but. Okay. Uh, stream key. Let's come in here. Okay, so we have a guest, apparently. One second, I'm trying to figure things out. There's... Computers are weird. Okay, we're gonna just not do... Wait, Daniel, says, can you see the stream right now? Um... Yes... Is it working if I come and type something under introduction? Well, when are you going to type something under I just introduction? Typed it, so it's going to take nope. Us. Also, why do you have cadavers? What? Search stuff. It says you have cadavers. Because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> Isn't it like dead bodies? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's not showing up at all, Josh. Uh, the stream is it or nothing is? Because there's delay, so. How? I'm like, I'm using a microphone this time. It's so weird. That's just what happens when you have a good microphone. So this is a good microphone now? I guess. Haha. -ha. Okay, Yay. So I oh, wait, wait, I, ju I just saw that. Hello. No, no, it's, I think it's live now. Try typing something again. Well, it's going to take a second, so. Well, I just I delete the cadavers and I see hello under introduction now. Okay, it's working. We're good. I say we just get going, and then people can filter in. Here, let me add. Okay. Okay, we have a guest. How do I add guest people in? I don't even know how this works. 
Josh. Yes. How does guest work? How do I put people in? Uh, are they in the Discord? Uh, yes, I believe they have Discord. It's Ryan. Ryan, who? Gronage. I have no idea who that is. Uh, um. Um. How do I describe or do Ryan I know Gronage? Who that is. is that the per Is that the Ryan who hangs out with us? Sometimes. Yeah, I think so. Well, they hang out with like Nick Brandt a lot. Okay. Uh. I think you know them. I don't know. I I'm confused. I have no idea how to add them. Okay, whatever. We'll just figure something out. <laughs> do you have their Discord? Because I don't know if I do, and I don't know what channel I'm sharing. There you go. Okay. Uh, you hear what's like? Actually, I think I figured it out. Wait. Oh, did I just I just pressed the invite people thing. Okay. And then we can just put them into chat, whoever joins in, because we like we have the boys status. Haha. <laughs> okay. I think that worked. Did that work? Josh, I don't know how computers work. Hey. There are people watching. Hi guys, we're having technical difficulties right now, so if you're listening, just chill out in the chat and have fun. Also, we're missing one of the ends, or we're currently missing both of the ends, but one of the ends is gonna get here in a minute, hopefully. Should I just like text Nick? I'm gonna text Nick. Which one, Nick, Daniel? Brant. I pinged him in the chat, Daniel. But the text, he... the text isn't gonna be any more effective. You pinged him in the chat? You did well. You did the one for OBS. Also, should we add Ryan into the voice? I don't know how to do so, that. <laughs> That's probably what it looks like. Yeah. Do you like drag and drop him? Oh, you you can take care of that. Yeah. Okie dokie. Oh, you can do like. Oh wait, wait. Could I? Oh, I was gonna use the cool. Oh. Welcome Hi. to A Push with the boys, featuring Hi. half of the boys because Nick Brett's being late. But soon, most of the boys. Am I? Are you doing the live thing? Am I on the live stream? You are live right now. Oh. Say okay. hello to the world. Oh, gravy. Hi, hello. My name is Ryan. I think I'm going to be doing things. They told me that. Daniel. That is correct. <laughs> I, I told you. I don't know what I said. Okay, so does the link I For some you? reason, I anticipated watching it as it was happening, which I now realize makes no sense at all. Well, I mean, well, that's what, what we, have. we have. We have, I, I have, sure I have one of the, um, I, I have, like, the page open. I just have it muted, and then I have oh, the really? chat. What? Yeah, and then I have the Hang chat, on. like. And that, that way I can like, the my, yes, uh, it is. Also, I can send a link on Slack. What? Also, Nick Brandt should be here. Then Josh, you sent the link into Jen. Yeah. There is. yeah. Oh, whack. Yep, that's my entire voice. I'm right there. There you are. All right, I'm gonna go put stuff on social stuff, and hopefully Josh, not Josh, Nick, whatever the person's name is, Nick. That's his name. Yeah, where are the Nick's? Soon. One of the Nicks, Nick Lee, is just. Absent and being then lame Nick Brent. What? Leet's being lame. -o. Yeah. Oh, that's no good. And then Brent went to go eat dinner two hours ago and just somewhere. <laughs> he's getting here, but he's not here. Lame. All right. All right, all right. We're going to add this to a start. We have five people watching already. This is pretty good. That means we have two people that's not us watching. All right, guys. Just like we're still chilling. We're getting ready. Also, Josh, like the stream looks so weird without like the Nick's stuff. It's like different. It's cool. Yeah, because you can actually have my desktop now, which I don't know if I like and I don't know how to fix it. So Because just... you have three computers. <laughs> five. You have five computers. No, you have eight. You have like nerd stuff. Dang, I don't I know how two, it works. Three monitors. It's okay. It's computers, monitors, same difference. Oh, also, I um, I do have a question. Yes. Am I allowed to say naughty words on here? Is, do you not want not. that? Okay. Um, I, well, understandable. But like, if it slips, that's fine. PG yeah, thirteen like, in general. It's okay. Not like no, I mean, I can, I can keep it. I can yeah. keep it chill if that's what y'all are, are going. Well, with. I mean, like, if it's yeah, just like in general. I mean, if you say something bad, it's like not like that yeah, yeah, the world, yeah. but like right. yeah. In general, go things that would make. Office you're expelled no and general things that would make daniel not cringe is good no, me, okay yeah 
So yeah, <laughs> that's all you need to know. That's all you need. Daniel standards, and you'll be fine. Literally just Daniel standards, and you know Daniel standards. Everyone knows Daniel standards. Daniel, Daniel standards, standards are good standards. Daniel standards. Yeah. Was that a disapproval? Oh, Amatil, hola boys, what is up, Amatil? Hello. Amatil. Sorry about that, but we are ready to go pretty soon. I think I'm gonna. We're gonna wait till eight thirty-five. I think just like to let people join in, sure. and hopefully have Nick Brandt join in, and then if Nick Brandt's well, just being wacky. He said he's gonna join like anyway, so. I can just call him on the phone and bother him. I mean, that's like available, he's out. At, no, he's like out at dinner with like family. So I choose not to care. Well, <laughs> there, that's that's one way to do it. That works as well. It's not gonna <laughs> change anything if he's at dinner. <laughs> no way! I just closed the op. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let me put this up on socials, and we'll be all good. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm gonna be reading this on my phone. You, you could just do you have like a desktop or laptop well, or something i'm on my laptop right now and that's what i'm on for this but i i mean i have it on here it's fine well i mean i just yeah. use it all i have everything i have well i have the discord app and then i have the yop page and the youtube page and i just switch between the two so when i'm not reading i'm on the youtube page when i'm reading i'm on the yop page yeah that makes sense this is kind of small all right we're live and then there's me and i have an extra monitor that I josh just flexing with. on us <laughs> brutal I don't know how I'm gonna get it to work with like having three different people have a monitor, but we'll see. I don't know what that means, but I, have, I support. Have, have different people having notes. Okay, what color should I make the text for? Insert. We're going green because green's cool. Heck We're yeah, live. It is. We're live. Link in bio. Woo woo. Okay, how long does that take to happen? Live stream should go black in two seconds. I think there's like a little bit of a delay on it. Oh, there's there is a, a bit of a, yeah, there is. Yeah. But that's only noticeable to us, not noticeable to the rest of the peoples. Right, no, obviously I'm just saying. Like if you want to test <laughs> well, something. Well, there is because if they're saying stuff in chat, it's going to take us a second to see it. Well, that's just going to yeah. happen anyway. Well, we'll, like, we'll see it. As, like, yeah, there it goes. Yeah. Wow, that's a long delay. Oh well, my god, yeah, it is. The screen okay. just went dark. Yeah. Oh no. Yep. Darkness oh, reigns upon the two. universe. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, also I have to like, put this up on, like, how do I shout out a story on my actual main story? Oh, Social media makes no sense. I don't remember how to repost something. Um, oh, wait, wait I, I can know. shout you out in my story, Ryan. Ha ha. Let's delete that one, and we're going to post a new one. Delay Josh, why is it? Why seconds. is it just? Why is it? Just, oh, okay, it's back out. <laughs> it was just seconds. dark. It's... That's why, because it takes twenty seconds for it to fix itself. Uh, okay, maybe that fixed it or not. I don't know. I mean, it's open. It's fine. Yeah. All right, I'm about it's to finish up with now, the but... advertisement, and we'll oh, be dang. all good. We just we out here advertising, you know. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! What color should I... Ryan, what's your favorite color? Um... Oh, Yasha already did blue, didn't he? Um... Well, this like is... This is this isn't this is for the white. thumbnail. Well, actually, we, we could be for the thumbnail also, but... Whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I Nick, like purple. I think Nick Brand's the thumbnail person. Unless Josh is making this thumbnail, but who knows? I don't know how to change the thumbnail. I could probably do it afterward. <laughs> oh, there's this big edit video button. Maybe if I click that. Hey, thumbnail! <laughs> Whoa! Well, there you go. Right? Uh, where's the picture I'm using? That one. Hey, now there's a thumbnail. Hey. 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 <laughs> Mama mia. Alright, put that up on the story. Yee yee. Now we gotta Yee. edit. <laughs> Yee. Alright. Oh, we just lost the viewer because we're not doing anything. Alright, you guys <laughs> wait. <laughs> it might have been me. It might have been me. It's okay. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I'm not actually watching it now. Now it should go back up. Is he gonna go back up? The moment of truth, um, uh, hypothetically, possibly. All right. Well, we're, we're figuring it all out right now. All right. Let me put the link up. Copy text. Put the link in the YouTube chat itself. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Could somebody do that? I could do that eventually, but right now I'm busy. Daniel, that's a else. terrible idea. That is a terrible idea. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. I yeah. 
terrible idea. Don't do that, I mean, everybody. The folks, the folks listening at home are really getting the, the behind the scenes, like, you know. Yeah. Like a cutting room floor stuff over here. Yeah. You I, sure I, are. I, I could show you guys <laughs> everything if you want. All right, you guys. Well, it's 8.36. We got, we lost viewers because we're not talking, so we get, like, <laughs> get stuff going soon. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. That's that's good. Okay, so we're all good. So you know what, Nick Brandt is gonna have to join in late. We're gonna start reading. As he actually, you know what? As soon as we get four viewers, we'll start. So we're just gonna like chill here till four viewers. While we're chilling, you guys want to hear some fun trivia? Wait, when did when did Nick say he was gonna be here? Like eight o'clock. Oh. <laughs> We don't need Nick. Actually, no, we do need Nick. Wait, we just want them to do watch him. No, no I was joking. Nick, come back. No. All right. Well, we're at three watching. So, while we're waiting, I can give you some cool Cold War trivia facts. So, me. Oh my gosh, Fiona's here. Hi, Fiona. And we have four. You guys, you know what? I think it's time for us. To, it's, it's time for us to start. We have four watchers, and we have Fiona. Honestly, like. What more do we need? Josh, you ready? Josh is muted. Josh, you there? You ready? Uh, I'm ready. All right. Well, the third annual, third, the third, the third we time did. has begun. So, um, Ryan, do you want the honors of reading the introduction? Oh boy, do I? Okay. Um. Use that big boy reading voice. Use that big boy reading voice. Okay, how, um, we should have worked this out beforehand. Hi, hi Fiona. Um, how, just like, slow or fast do you want me to do this? Not super so, fast. So, yeah, Josh I'm is, like, the type at the same time. Okay, so, for introduction, sense. there's probably not that much information, well, yeah, but, like, okay. in general, like, especially, like, if there's, like, if there's any, like, acronyms or, like, name things, so, like, if there's, like, a name of a law, a name of, like, a, like, meeting, a name yeah. of a person, then, like, slow down for, like, a minute there, because, like, they're going to have to type in, like, vocab stuff. Yeah. And then in general, just like for like other important things, slow down to it. But like otherwise, just like normal reading ish speed. Okay. Just because uh, I, I normally talk, I feel like kind of fast. So I mean, just tell me if it's getting out of hand. All right. Yeah, we'll tell you to slow down. Josh, okay. Josh is good at that. But we're still holding on. I'm doing something else. I'm getting out another list. Yeah, you are. Woohoo. Did you guys read the yeah, eugenics you are. thing yet? Do we what? Read the eugenics thing? I have not read the eugenics thing yet. Or either of you. The, oh, that's right. Should we? We should probably read the eugenics thing also. We should, cause I already we, read it though. Cause Carpenter like hadn't printed it out, and we all like forgot to get it because he well, said. Well, it's to not like we actually do something in Carpenter's class. Carpenter, but we do I mean, stuff yeah, in Carpenter's class. It, it is. It is on the Google Classroom though, cause Ambrose is like organized. <laughs> yes. Carpenter. <laughs> you know, Carpenter's trying his best. Is he? We, I, we we stand Carpenter. Yeah, we do stand actually. I don't know. We do stand. <laughs> um, okay, all right. Good. Actually, do we? Yeah, we'll just we'll leave the eugenics thing for later. If we have time at the end, which I doubt we will, we could like read over that. Anyways, did you put the link to the live stream in the live stream chat? I did because yes. I thought it was such a bad idea. <laughs> I, th I think did it's Daniel a good do idea. it too? I could do it too. Oh, okay. It's just me. Well, there we go. I did it too. Good job. I'm real proud of you. We're all good. All right. Well, take it away. Okay. Uh, all right. Chapter 25, The Cold War. Introduction. Relations between the United States and the Soviet Union, erstwhile allies, soured soon after World War II. On February 22nd, 1946, less than a year after the end of the war, the charged affairs of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, George Kennan sent a famously lengthy telegram, literally referred to as the Long Telegram, to the, State That's Department, a good name right there. Yeah, to the State Department denouncing the Soviet Union. World communism is like a malignant parasite which feeds only on diseased tissue, he wrote, and the steady advance of uneasy Russian nationalism in the new guise, guise of international Marxism is more dangerous and insidious than ever before, end quote. There could be no cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union, Kennan wrote. Instead, the Soviets had to be contained. Less than two weeks later, on March 5th, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill visited President Harry Truman in his home state of Missouri and declared that Europe had been cut in half, divided by an iron curtain that had descended across the continent. Aggressive anti-Soviet sentiment... Stalin. Yeah, that's Stalin, baby. Um, 
aggressive anti-Soviet sentiment seized the American government and soon the American people. The Cold War was a global political and ideological struggle between capitalist and communist countries, particularly between the two surviving superpowers of the post-war world, the United States and the, Un the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR. Cold, because it was never a hot, direct shooting war between the United States and the Soviet Union, the generations-long, multifaceted rivalry nevertheless bent the world to its whims. Tensions ran highest, perhaps, during the first Cold War, which lasted from the mid-1940s to the mid-1960s, after which followed a period of relaxed tensions and increased communication and co cooperation, known by the French term uh, détente, until the second Cold War interceded. Francais, baby. Um, oui, oui. Uh, until the Second Cold War interceded from roughly 1979 until the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. The Cold War reshaped the world and the generations of Americans that had lived under its shadow. All right. That was that was a beautiful voice. That was, that was great. 10 out of 10. Oh, yeah, thank would, you. Would listen to you reading an audiobook on Audible again. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, Josh, you ready for section two? So we're gonna get some sections. You're good. There's All only right. six sections, by the way. Oh really? Sounds... Oh, okay. But they're chunky. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, I have to they're, like long. they're all chunky. They're all. Oh chunky. baby. Oh, section two is a real chonker. All right. So, <clears throat> Roman numeral two, political, economic, and military dimensions. The Cold War grew out of a failure to achieve a durable settlement among leaders from the Big Three Allies, the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, as they met at Yalta in Russian Crimea woo -woo, and at uh, Potsdam <laughs> in occupied Germany to shape the post-war order. The Germans had pillaged their way across Eastern Europe, and the Soviets had pillaged their way back. Millions of lives were lost. Stalin considered the newly conquered territory part of a Soviet sphere of influence. With Germany's defeat imminent, the Allies set terms for unconditional surrender. At the same time, deliberation began over reparations, tribunals, and the nature of an occupation regime that would initially be divided into American, British, French, and Soviet zones, East Germany and West Germany coming up. Suspicion and mistrust were already mounting. The political landscape was already or, or was altered drastically by Franklin Roosevelt's sudden death in April of uh, 1945, just days before the inaugural meeting of the UN. Although Roosevelt was skeptical of Stalin, he always held that hope that the Soviets would be brought into the free world. Truman, like Churchill, had no such illusions. He committed the United States to a hard-line, anti-Soviet approach. At the Potsdam Conference, held on the outskirts of Berlin from mid-July to early August, the Allies debated the fate of Soviet-occupied Poland. Towards the end of the meeting, the American delegation received word that the Manhattan Project scientists had successfully tested an atomic bomb. On July 24th, when Truman told Stalin about this new weapon of unusual destructive force, the Soviet leader simply nodded his acknowledgement and said that he hoped the Americans would make good use of it. What an absolute legend. <laughs> what a the, <laughs> Cold War <laughs> the Cold War had long roots. The, uh, the World War II alliance of convenience was not enough to erase decades of mutual suspicions. The Bolshevik Revolution had overthrown the Russian Tsarists during World War I. Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin urged an immediate worldwide peace that would pave the way for world socialism, just as Woodrow Wilson brought the United States into the war with promises of global democracy and free trade. The United States had intervened militarily against the Red Army during the Russian Civil War, and when the Soviet Union was founded in 1922, the United States refused to recognize it. The two powers were brought together only by their common enemy, and without the common enemy, there is little hope for cooperation. The common enemy was Nazis. <laughs> on the, <Sorry>. on the, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm so tired. Okay, uh, on the eve of American involvement in World War II, on August 14th, 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill had issued a joint declaration of goals for post-war peace, known as the Atlantic Charter. An adaptation of Wilson's 14 points, the Atlantic Charter established the creation of the United Nations. Oh, Atlantic Charter is like important. I'd like write that down. Uh, what was that? Yeah, so the Soviet Union was among the 50 charter UN member states and was given one of five seats alongside the United States, Britain, France, and China on the Select Security Council. The Atlantic Charter also set in motion the planning for a reorganized global economy. 
The July 1944 UN Financial and Monetary Conference, most popularly known as the Bretton Woods Conference, created the International Monetary Fund, IMF, then the forerunner of the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, IBRD. The Bretton Woods system was bolstered in 1947 with the addition of the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, we have some cool acronyms, forerunner of the World Trade Organization, WTO. The Soviets rejected it all. Okay. Okay. So, so there's a whole bunch of acronyms right there. So I could like repeat some. Are any of them yeah. important? Um, uh, the world, tr the World Bank, and the IMF are decently important. Like I still remember that from World History with Mr. Forslund. Okay. I would but, say the World Trade Organization is something that I've like heard of. So. Yeah. Maybe. The W. The WTO. Yeah. Yeah. Brent was systems bolstered and. Uh, with the addition of the general agreement tariff trade, blah, 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 the foreign. Okay, um, I'm just gonna copy this down. Be like, yeah, that exists. Yeah, that exists. All right. Oh, you're just copy pasting it. That works also. <laughs> All right. Uh, many officials on both sides knew that the Soviet Union or the Soviet American relationship would dissolve into renewed hostility at the end of the war. And events proved them right. In 1946 alone, the Soviet Union refused to cede parts of occupied Iran as Soviet defector betrayed, or sorry, yeah, of occupied Iran. A Soviet uh, defector betrayed a Soviet spy who had worked on the Manhattan Project. And the United States refused Soviet calls to dismantle its nuclear arsenal. In 1947, article for foreign affairs written, uh, in, or sorry, in a 1947 article for foreign affairs written under the pseudonym Mr. X, George Kennan warned that Americans should continue to regard the Soviet Union as a rival, not a partner, since Stalin harbored no real faith in the possibility of a permanent happy coexistence of the socialist and capitalist world. He urged U.S. leaders to pursue a policy of firm containment designed to confront the Russian. So, they weren't chilling that much. Who was that? That was Mr. X, also known as George Kennan. Why is he important? George Kennan, probably. George Kennan, it's like Kennedy, but without the D. But why is he important? George Kennedy. Because he, I don't think he's that important, but he's just a guy that Warren, or that was like saying that, oh, hey, Soviet Union's like not chill. We should like do cool. something about that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else do I need for that section? Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so Truman on March 12th, 1947, announced $400 million in aid to Greece and Turkey, where terrorist activities led by communists jeopardized democratic governance. With Britain reducing or liquidating its commitments in several parts of the world, including Greece, it fell on the United States, Truman said, to support free peoples resisting attempted subjugation by outside pressures. The so-called, oh, this is extremely important, Truman Doctrine became a cornerstone of the American policy of containment. Truman Doctrine is like a big thing, like, they, they think the chapter gloss is over, but I'm sure, like, for you, Ambrose, and, like, for us, Carpenter is going to talk about it. Like, a lot of stuff happened with the Truman Doctrine. It was, like, the U.S.'s, like, foreign policy for, like, 50 years. And, um... Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! Who is it? Nick Brent! Nick Brent! Nick Brent! What's going on? Nick Brent! Wait, we're still alive. We are still alive. That's the point. That is the point. Welcome, Nick Brandt. Whoa, we now have DJ One N. Almost. Yeah, we just call it DJ N. DJ N. DJ R N. Oh, what? there's. Oh, none of us have start with vowels, so it's like <laughs> hard to make an actual <laughs> word out of it. Um, sure. All right. Uh, so Nick, we are currently yeah. like a third of the way through section two. <laughs> okay, you guys haven't made it that I far. Mean, it's, it's really yeah. Well, one. there's only six the sections. Section is the introduction. Yeah, there's only six How sections. Far is like, the third of the way? Uh, it's a decent, like, section two is, I think, the biggest section of the... Have you gotten to the image yet? Uh, this is the plans? The images. Yeah. No, I'm one paragraph, two paragraphs away. So, the European so, Recovery yeah. Program? Yeah, we just talked about the Truman Doctrine, so we're Nick, getting... share your notes with me at some point, with my Gmail. Um, I'm just gonna share my entire folder, actually. Whoa. <laughs> well, that's oh. pretty neat. Oh my gosh, it's so nice having Nick here. Hi, Nick. Is this you, Daniel? <laughs> what? Am I not enough for you, Daniel? Gosh, <laughs> what? Can you, can you tell it's the just, different mic quality? You know, you, actually, uh, well, 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 I can. 
Just oh my gosh, it. I hear a beep. Well, you know, yeah. well, first off, there's just like, it's not the, the same without the this? entire DJ to one. You know, you need to have like the full experience to experience Where's, where's experience. Lee? Boulder. Did you share it with me yet? Leet's right, just send it. Oh, I didn't share it with you. Leet's just, just chilling. He's just chilling. Oh, did you put it in some chat? Leet's just vibing, dude. Yeah, I'll share it. Leet's just vibing. Give me a second. No, it's fine. I got it. Sure thing. We're still just here. Well, okay, now it's shared with you too. So, yay. Okay. What's this chapter called? The Cold War. The Cold War. <laughs> really original. <laughs> Uh, whatever. I'll add header later. Oh my gosh, that keyboard <laughs> typing. Oh, uh, yes, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Political, economic, and military dimensions. Okay, go. Alrighty. Well, starting back up. So, where was the Truman Doctrine? Where were we? In All the right. harsh winter, I think? Yes. In the harsh winter of 1946-1947, famine loomed in much of continental Europe. Blizzards and freeing cold halted... What? Is that sound? Cold halted coal production. I'm just cracking open a cold one, sorry. <laughs> Factories closed. Unemployment spiked. Amid these conditions, the communist parties of France and Italy gained nearly a third of the seats in their respective parliament. American officials worried that Europe's impoverished masses were increasingly vulnerable to Soviet propaganda. Oh no. Their situation remained dire through the spring. When Secretary of State General George Marshall, oh, George Marshall's another big dude, uh, mm -hmm. gave an address at Harvard University on June 5th, 1947, suggesting that the United States should do whatever it is able to do to assist in the return of normal economic health to the world, without which there could be no political stability and no assured peace. Although Marshall had stipulated to potential critics that his proposal was not directed against any country, but against hunger, poverty, and chaos, Stalin clearly understood this as an assault against communism in Europe. He saw it as a Trojan horse designed to lure Germany and other countries into cap into the capitalist web. Wow. Okay, hold on. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. So it's just pretty much George Mar George Marshall and the Marshall Plan, which is like. Wait, we haven't gotten to that yet, have we? No, good. We're just, no. just talk. What? Well, we're gonna. Okay, I'm. I know. General George Marshall made uh, yeah, a statement I, I... talking about how communism bad. <laughs> That's perfect, yes. Okay, uh, good. I, was I just, yeah, I skipped other ahead. So... <laughs> I just, I skipped ahead, because, like, I just know about the Marshall Finance Bowl. Anyways, perfect. the European um... Recovery Program, ERP, probably, <laughs> ERP time, popularly known as the Marshall Plan, pumped enormous sums of capital into Western Europe. From 1948 to 1952, the United States invested $13 billion toward reconstruction while simultaneously loosening trade barriers. That's a lot of billions. To avoid the post-war chaos of World War I, the Marshall Plan was designed to rebuild Western Europe, open markets, and win European support for capitalist democracies. The Soviets countered with their rival Molotov Plan, like Molotov cocktails, yeah, uh, yeah. a symbolic pledge of aid to Eastern Europe. Polish leader Joseph Syriakowiecki was rewarded with a five-year, sure. yeah, with a five-year, four hundred fifty million dollar trade agreement from Russia for boycotting the Marshall Plan. Stalin was jealous of Eastern Europe. When Czechoslovakia received two hundred million dollars in American assistance, Stalin summoned French, uh, sorry, not French, Czech Foreign Minister John Marsik to Moscow. Mm. Uh, Masaryk later recounted that he went to Moscow as the Foreign Minister of an independent sovereign state, but he returned as a lackey of the Soviet government. Hmm, that's weird how that happened. Well, that's, that's no good. <laughs> Stalin exercised even tighter control over Soviet satellite countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Wait, what just happened? Uh, so this Czech guy was like, hey and Stalin, you've got some money. And then Stalin was like, yeah, well, you're not anymore. You're part of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And that's just how wow. it went. Well, he Wait, didn't, like, so... they technically didn't become part of the Soviet Union, like, part of the Soviet Union, but they became but a satellite country. they got, country. like, chill with each other. Oh, uh, so basically, chill. the United States uh, gave Czechoslovakia yeah, some money, and Soviet Just... Union was like, ha, nah, that's mine now. Wait, did yeah, they get the money, or did they just convince the dude to become a communist? They just made him a satellite country, which means that they, like, took control over the country. Yeah, oh. I guess chill is the wrong word, but, like... Yeah, <laughs> Do you have notes yet? You do. We're gonna look at your notes.
notes for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna look at oh, wait, okay. hold on. Oh, this is fine. We're good. Now I just have to reorganize things this way. Yay. <clears throat> Yay. Oh, oh gosh, I almost dropped my phone. All right. The situation in Germany, meanwhile, deteriorated. Berlin had been divided into communist and capitalist zones, East Germany and West Germany. In June 1948, when U.S., British, and French officials introduced a new currency, the Soviet Union initiated a ground blockade, cutting off rail and road access to West Berlin, landlocked within the Soviet occupation zone, to gain control over the entire city. The United States organized and coordinated a massive airlift that flew essential supplies into the beleaguered, or beleaguered, beleaguered. beleaguered city beleaguered. for 11, beleaguered city yep, for 11 months. One. Until until Soviets lifted the blockade on May 12, 1949. Germany was officially broken in half. On May 23rd, the western half of the country was formally renamed the Federal Republic of Germany, FRG. And the eastern for <laughs> and the eastern Soviet zone became the German Democratic the Demon <laughs> Democratic Republic. <laughs> <laughs> the GDR. Later that fall. <laughs> uh, Berlin, which lay squarely within the GDR, was divided into two sections. And from August 1961 until 19 or er, until November 1989, families seemed separated by physical walls. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down. This oh, wall. it all makes sense now. Yeah. I have a friend whose grandmother like has part of the Berlin Wall. No way. We have part of the Berlin Wall. Really? You have part of the Berlin Wall? Oh, we do. Wow, you're all well, that's awesome. <laughs> what I want part of the Berlin Wall, Josh. Next time I'm at your house, you have to show me that. I don't know where it is, but you just have part <laughs> of the wall you somewhere. Lost it? Yes, you lost the Berlin Wall. No. <laughs> oh no, Berlin Wall, come back. Where'd you go? Can we take those so that? Josh's uh, fault that they took it down. Uh, it's what? It's Josh's, it's Josh's fault. fault. That they took yeah. It down. <laughs> Josh misplaced the wall. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The savage. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most straight faced way to say. It. Wow, what a savage! All right. <laughs> In summer of 1949, American officials launched the North Atlantic Treaty Organization (NATO). That's still in effect today as the largest treaty organization in the world, and bro. mutually, yeah, bro, it's important. It's a key term. It sure important. is important. That is 100% facts, not fiction. <clears throat> nice, Daniel. Yes, that was a very meek and thing to say. Uh, <laughs> a mutual defense pact in which the United States and Canada were joined by England, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, Portugal, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. I think Norway was the word they wanted. Yep. <laughs> I said Norway, didn't I? Kids, did? don't, don't do one hour of sleep in 24 hours. It's not fun for your head. It goes oh, places. Uh, the Soviet Union would formalize its own collective defensive agreement in 1955, the Warsaw Pact. That's also important. Uh, and the Warsaw Pact contained Albania, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and East Germany. And Russia. Yeah. And, yep, that's, that's where it goes. There. Woo! <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> liberal journalist uh, Walter Lippmann was largely responsible for popularizing the term Cold War in his book, The Cold War, a study in the U.S. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> in his book, The Cold War, a study in U.S. foreign policy, published in 1947. Well, because he's the first one that came up with the term Cold War. Okay, uh, so Lippmann envisioned a prolonged stalemate between the United States and the USSR, a world of or a war of worlds and ideas in which direct shots would not necessarily be fired between the two. Lippmann agreed that the Soviet Union would not only be prevented from expanding if it were confronted with American power, but he felt that the strategical conception and plan recommended by Mr. X, hot mentioned earlier, George Kennan, was fundamentally unsound as it would require having the money and the military power always available in sufficient amounts to apply counterforce at constantly shifting points all over the world. Lippmann cautioned against making far-flung, open-ended commitments, favoring instead a more limited engagement that focused on halting the influence of communism in the heart of Europe. He believed that if the Soviet system were successful, he was trained on the continent, it would otherwise be left alone to collapse under the weight of its own imperfections. 
so Lipman said that you know what we don't need to make like a strong army or whatever we have to just contain communism where it is and not let it get into Europe and so they're like we're not letting France become communist so France became on communist <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, Josh. The more I read about communism, the more I'm like thinking about like the thing from Biden with like ending the essay with and you become a communist, and that's just that's great. Yeah, I kind of want to do that now for my essay. Anyways, uh, <laughs> a new chapter in the Cold War began on October first, nineteen forty-nine, when the CCP. Oh, oh, oh! It's Mao Zedong, led by Mao Zedong, <laughs> declared that's victory. Declared victory against the Kuman Ningtang nationalists led by Western back Chiang Kai shek. Yash is not here to annoy me about that. <laughs> yeah. The, the Kuomintang Mintang the Kuoming the Kuoming retreated the off Kuomintang retreated off the too. islands of Taiwan and the CCP took over the mainland under the red flag of the People's Republic of China, PRC. Coming so soon after the Soviet Union's successful test of an atomic bomb, on August 29th, the loss of China, the world's most populous country, contributed to a sense of panic among American foreign policymakers, whose attention began to shift from Europe to Asia. After Dean Atkinson, that was some intense typing, uh, became Secretary of State in 1949, Kennan was replaced in the State Department by former investment banker Paul Nitz, whose first task was to help compose an Atkinson, uh, as Atkinson, Later Akison? described it, Akis, Akison, Akison. I have no idea. I have no Akison. idea either. Akison later described in his memoir a document designed to bludgeon the mass minds of top government into approving a substantial increase in military expenditures. So they mm -hmm. say, you know what? It's time to invest in our military, and that's how the Cold War began because they both started making their militaries chunky, and they just. Oh, is that each all that out. happened? Just people invested in military. Can I just write that? But like it was more than that but like it, it's very basic yeah that's that's it People also there's this lovely image military. here of, of uh Stalin shaking hands with Mao Zedong there it's sure is bros. which seems like a fake thing that they're, happened they're bros. no here it is it's straight up on the money yeah there it goes it's just the bros just, 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 just the bros chilling just they're just chilling vibing bros. dude they're just vibing you know Stalin in the house they're just vibing yeah. <laughs> alright uh, oh, we're almost done with the session. Oh, never mind. No, we're not. We're getting there. We're over halfway on the session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The National Security Memorandum 68. United States... Oh, that's a long memo. United States Objectives and Programs for National Security. A natu National Defense Memo, later known as NSC 68. That's probably important. Oh, achieved okay. its goal. Uh, issued in April 1950, the nearly 60-page classified memo born of an increasingly terrifying weapon... <laughs> Or warned of increasingly terrifying weapons of mass Sorry. destruction, which served to remind every individual of the ever-present possibility of annihilation. It said that leaders of the USSR and its international communist movement thought only to retain and solidify their absolute power. As a central bulwark of opposition to the Soviet expansion, America had become the principal enemy that must be subverted or destroyed by one means or another. NC or NSC 68 is the rapid buildup of political, economic, and military strength in order to roll back the Kremlin's drive for world domination. Kremlin? Kremlin, yes, the Kremlin. You guys don't know what the Kremlin is? The Kremlin's yeah, the super Kremlin. cool. The super cool tower in Moscow. I've been in the Kremlin. Did I tell you guys how I saw Putin once? But that's that's irrelevant. But like, he's super Putin. cool. <laughs> I didn't speak to him, and like, it was from a large distance. But yeah, he was like in the Kremlin, Dude. and like, he had like guards oh, yeah. around him and everything. And I got to see him in the crowd, and it was super cool, and I felt really happy. Whoa. Like, that's cool. Yeah, the that's Red like, Square is like, so brothers. cool. Yeah, we just like we we spiritually bonded for a moment. Soul bound. Cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, NSC sixty eight is the rapid buildup of political, economic, and military strength in order to roll back the. Oh, sorry, I read that. Uh, such a massive commitment of resources, amounting to more than a threefold increase in the annual defense budget, was necessary because of the USSR, or because <laughs> because of the USSR, because the USSR, unlike previous aspirants to hegemony, he hegemony, hegemony. hegemony. Hegemony was animated by a new fanatic faith. You know what? Maxon would call that Ingfish. Seeking to impo impose its absolute. That is. that is definitely Ingfish. To impose its absolute authority over the rest of the world. No. Both Kennan and. Okay, I guess it is Josh. Both Kennan and Lipman were among a minority in the foreign policy establishment, 
who argued to no avail that such a militarization of containment was ta uh, tra tragically wrong-headed. Um, so that's just like a okay. paragraph about NS. Threefold increase in budget was argued against by some. <laughs> I, saw, I, I wrote that's... this was. I, I wrote that some people saw this as being bad. Hmm. <laughs> that's Almost bad. like every other some people issue didn't like history. this. <laughs> really? I didn't notice well, that. I mean, I think we can all agree upon pineapple not belonging to pizza as something that history agrees upon, right? What? Pineapple definitely belongs on pizza. Yeah. Pineapple slaps on pizza. See, it's wait, an agreement. Yeah, it's wait. fine. <laughs> wait a minute. Daniel. No, that's not supposed to happen Daniel's this way. Over there. Tables just wait, got why, why the majority is pineapple? Hey, I don't like this. Times have changed, buddy. No, I have rights. No, you don't. Oh my goodness. Our stream is so much worse today. <laughs> Well, it's because we're not like we're not streaming at our average time. Also, I didn't oh, like none true. of us. None of us posted on our social medias. I'm gonna post that. I'm posting right now on my social media. Nick, you should oh, do that too. Okay. Because like, Ryan, do you want to shout us out on your social media story? Uh, sure. Heck Bro, yeah. I'm gonna read for a hot second then. You're gonna read for a hot second. All right. Well, should I'm doing I, should that. Should I do here. close up microphone reading? Yes. Okay. <clears> Started <throat> on June 25th. On June 25th, oh 1950, <laughs> as U.S. officials were considering so the merits of NSC 68's proposals, including the intensification of operations by covert means in the fields of economic, political, and psychological warfare, designed to foment, foment? They mean ferment? Anyway, <laughs> unrest and revolt in Soviet satellite countries. Fighting erupted in Korea between communists in the north and American-backed anti-communists in the south. That was such a lot. That was one sentence. Foment <laughs> means to promote the growth of. Oh, thank you. So basically, it just means ferment. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um. What is that sentence saying? That yeah, North Korea and South Korea was a thing, and communism was in the north. Yeah, and Pyongyang was in the back. Yeah. Okay. okay, is it just- am I just, like, really tired, or is this, like, really hard to comprehend? Nope, but yeah, you're not- it's not, it's it's really, not, it's not saying a whole lot. Okay, that was- that was Inkfish. That yeah, was Inkfish. Sure. Wait, but what is it actually trying to say? Other than, uh, like, it's just North and Korea? But there's also, like, the thing about NSC-68. So, NSC-68 was, um... Well, that oh, was- as, Okay, so the whole as thing was just there to throw us off, but on June 25th, 1950, fighting erupted in Korea. Got it! <laughs> <laughs> That's that's literally all that we tried to get out. Of. That's, I hate that's this great. sentence so much. Okay, nineteen fifty, Korea had 50? communist yeah. the anti-communist fighting break out. Yay! Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> After Japan surrendered in <laughs> September 1945, oh, yes. a U.S.-Soviet yeah, joint occupation had paved the way for the division of Korea. In November 1947. The United Nations passed a resolution that a united government in, sh in Korea should be created, but the Soviet Union refused to cooperate. Only the South held election. Wait, only the South held, elec held elections. The Republic of Korea, Rock, South Korea, was created three months after the election. A month later, communists in the North established the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. De -perk. Both claimed to stand for a unified Korean peninsula. The UN recognized the Rock. But incessant armed conflict broke out between North and South. Hey, hey, wait, hey, Ryan, how did you like do the cool repost thing? Uh oh, so, uh, you tagged me in that post, so I had a little option, like a big button that said "Add this to your story." Oh, lucky. Okay, know. never mind. Yeah, yeah. Just, I don't get that option. Sorry, okay. I don't know how it works when they didn't mention you. All right, you're like keep reading with your beautiful voice. Uh, but I'm taking notes too. Okay, oh, I'll, I'll go back to reading that. It's all good. Uh, wait, which one's communist and which one's not? Communism is in the north. Yeah, thank North Korea is communist. Yeah, communist South Korea is North Korea. North Korea. Korea. Thank, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna continue. I love your right. notes right now, Nick. They're great. <laughs> uh, after Japan surrendered in September 1945, a U.S.-Soviet joint occupation had Daniel, paved the way. Read that. No, we didn't. Yeah, we did. I knew that. Yeah, I was too busy being on to play. Okay. In the uh, spring of 1950. Yes, in the spring of 1950, Stalin hesitantly endorsed North Korean leader Kim Il-sung plan yep. to 
liberate the South by force, a plan heavily influenced by Mao's recent victory in China. Side note, isn't Kim Il-sung, like, Kim Jong-un's, like, grandfather or something? Probably. I th yeah. That's how that works. Because they're all the same family. No, no, it, it, it's the same family that's been, like, there for, like, yeah. ever. Yeah. Forever. Cool. Well, yes, it's 1950. No, that's well, forever, Josh. Yeah. That's yeah, the, Kim, the Kim Dynasty is a three-generation lineage. So yes. I was right. Yeah, so it's Kim Il-sung, then it's like Kim somebody else, and then it's Kim Jong-il. Yeah, it's have? him, and then Jong-il, and then jong who's now. It sure is. Uh, <laughs> while he did not desire a military confrontation with the United States, Stalin thought correctly that he could encourage his Chinese comrades to support North Korea. They used comrades, and ironically, I love that. Support <laughs> North Korea if the war turned against the DPRK. The North Koreans launched a successful the perk. Uh, the North Koreans launched a successful <laughs> surprise attack, and Seoul, the capital of South Korea, fell to the communists on June 28th. The UN passed resolutions demanding that North Korea cease hostilities and withdraw its armed forces. The 38th oh that's important the 38th parallel and yes. calling on member states to provide the ROK military assistance to repulse the northern attack. So to this day, the 38th parallel exists. And it's like this like weird like dead man zone. That's the DMZ, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like really? this weird area where just like, if you look at like, yeah, it's just a tweet. It's the border between North and South Korea. It is the border between North and South Korea. It's pretty neato. Or it's, it's not cool, pretty actually. neato. But what I mean, it's kind no, of- No, I mean, it's it, cool. It's like, if you, if you look at it from like, from space, and you look at like, city lights, it's like one of the only places in the world that just like, has like, no lights, and like this yeah. one man. Is it just like awesome. a line? It's just like a line of it's darkness. It's basically a neutral zone. That's actually really cool. It is <laughs> Neutral, but you'll die if you step in it. Yeah, you'll die, but it's... Uh, okay, I meant no man's land. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, That's much. better, that's better. Yeah. Dankin. Yeah, Dankin. Uh, <laughs> that July, UN forces mobilized under American General Douglas MacArthur, the man, the myth, the legend. Troops landed in Inchon a port city about 30 miles from Seoul, and took the city on September 28th. They moved on North Korea. On October 1st, ROK slash UN forces crossed the 38th parallel and broke the advance, or sorry, what, what, what just happened? Wait, uh, and on October 26th, yeah, <laughs> on October 26th, they reached the Yalu River, the traditional Korea-China border. They were met there by 300,000, oh my gosh, 300,000 Chinese <laughs> troops who broke the advance and rolled up the offensive. That's a surprise. Uh, on November 30th, ROK UN forces began a fevered retreat. Yeah, they started running away as soon as they saw it. Uh, they returned across the 38th parallel and abandoned Seoul on January 4th, 1951. Damn. The, they just saw the forces and skedaddled. Uh, the United Nations forces were grouped, but the war entered into a stalemate. General MacArthur, growing impatient and wanting to eliminate the communist threats, requested authorization to use nuclear weapons, oh my gosh, against North Korea and China. Denied, MacArthur publicly denounced Truman. How <laughs> 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 oh, dare you, Truman? I just wanted to mass murder a ton of people. God. Truman, you're not like me. You're not like me, Nick the Koreans. What the heck, bro? I denounce you. <laughs> Being bullied. <laughs> Truman, unwilling to threaten World War III and refusing to tolerate MacArthur's public insubordinations, dismissed the general in April. That's a euphemism for fired. <laughs> Really? <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> on, uh, on June 23rd, 1951, the Soviet ambassador to the UN suggested a ceasefire, which the United States immediately accepted. Peace talks continued for two years. Woo. There's a wacky picture of some sad MacArthur people MacArthur hugging each other. MacArthur. Daniel, you should be an interpreter. <laughs> I should. It's so sad, folks, just hugging each other. Well, I mean, am I wrong? Technically? No, I'm not. Exactly. Haha. -ha. Take that, anime. Why is this well, so again. dense? Okay, Nick, oh my you're goodness. You're wrong. Why? Why? That's wrong. I meant ceasefire. Anyway. No, up what's here. wrong? Up here. The stuff up I'm where? editing. You can see that, right? Nope, because you're on view mode. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to open the stream? Okay, one second. <laughs> no, don't open the stream. Just give me editing access. Oh, but like, okay, fine. I'm not gonna actually edit your document. Uh, Jarek, are you in your school account? No. Jarek. Oh, Jarek, what are you doing? Josh, Josh Eric, and Daniel. Oh, Jarek. It. We're chilling. Uh, we are you can chilling. comment. <clears throat> sure. Woot woot. Yes, I share with you. Alright, reload the page. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> all right well hey, what a positive actually, photo can i say okay i was just narrating it like wait, wait nick oh, or josh or somebody scroll scroll, scroll down photo. yeah wait nick you should narrate the photo while we're waiting with the stated policy of containing communism at home. Wait, 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 they actually stop for a second. They can't even see the photo in the live stream. No, they can. Gosh. Yes, they can. They can. Daniel, the um, the live stream is delayed, so. We are like way delayed. <laughs> oh, never so. mind. They can. Whoa, my live stream is really <laughs> laggy. Okay, it's, cool. It's not it's laggy. It's delayed it's by twenty seconds delay. because that was the default for some reason. Yeah, I know. Okay. It well, for, like, not, not, yeah, now we're now we're all delay. good. So you can keep narrating. Okay. With the stated policy of containing <laughs> communism at home and abroad, the U.S. pressured the United Nations to support the South Koreans and deployed American troops to the Korean Peninsula. Through, uh, though overshadowed in the annals of American history, the Korean War caused over 30,000 American deaths and 100,000 wounded, leaving an indelible mark on those who served. Whoa! I didn't know that was... It might be the annals. Annals. <laughs> I think it might be the annals. Is it the annals? I think it's the annals. I don't think it's the annals of American annals. history, folks. In the annals of American history. Don't ever do that again to me. Why can't I comment, Nick? The um, laugh. The laugh just does it every time. <laughs> there is both you and an anonymous platypus on the document, and I'm assuming the one you're trying to comment on is the anonymous platypus. No, I'm not. <laughs> anonymous platypus. What? Okay, whatever. It's Josh, fine. it's fine. I don't read my notes anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, you're just, uh, it bothers me. And okay, well, if whatever, the, stream tomorrow... see, the stream sees what it's highlighted, so it's fine. What? <laughs> It'll take 20 seconds. But, um, the part that's highlighted is wrong. <laughs> Alright, yeah. well, uh, General Dwight Eisenhower defeated Illinois governor Adlai Stevenson in the 1952 Adlai. Adlai. Uh -huh. in the 1952 presidential election, and Stalin died. Oh no. In March of 1953. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be the last Stalin. Uh, they, they gotta stop Stalin around. <laughs> also, sorry to do this to you, like, every word that you read, but did you say Illinois with an S? Illinois. Illinois. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Illinois. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the DPRK warmed to peace, and an armistice agreement was signed on July 27th, 1953. More than 1.5 million people had died during this conflict. Yay! <laughs> Said that so happily. Coming um, so soon after World War II and ending with a clear victory, Korea became for many Americans a forgotten war. Wait, one Decades second. later, though, the nation's other major interventions in Asia would be anything but forgotten. The Vietnam War had deep roots in the Cold War world. Vietnam had been colonized by France and seized by Japan during World War II. The nationalist leader, Ho Chi Minh, had been backed by the United States during his anti-Japanese insurgency. And following Japan's surrender in 1945, Viet Minh nationalists, quoting the American Declaration of Independence, created the Independent Democratic Republic of Vietnam, DRV. Yet France moved to reassert authority over its former colony in Indochina, and the United States sacrificed Vietnamese self-determination for France's colonial imperatives. Ho Chi Minh turned to the Soviet Union for assistance in waging war against the French colonizers in a protected war. After French troops were defeated wait, at the battle, well, this is all this is all relevant for. Oh God, oh wait. It's all irrelevant. No, it's all relevant. None of it means anything. War. No, it's um, talking about the Vietnam War, which is like decently yeah, important. Walton, why are you saying it's okay? Anyway, uh. Um... No, he said irrelevant. I said relevant. Somebody else said irrelevant. I don't remember who said that though. Irrelevant. You're irrelevant. I don't know. Your it's mom's irrelevant. Oh, sorry. Oh, irrelevant. With Yeah, that's one. Shrimp. Uh, I, mm, uh, hmm. Hmm. And some hmm. others made the Democratic Republic of the. I don't even know. I don't even know what oh. happened there. I'm gonna get Daniel to summarize it, and we're gonna. Be Daniel, good. what does that paragraph mean? Yeah. I got you. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> World War II had ended, and this place in South Asia, known as Vietnam, became a thing. Well, it has it been a thing for a while, but like it became like an important thing in the eyes of Americans. Because like Vietnam was like, yo, America, we're going to help y'all. We're going to get rid of Japan, because Japan's not very cool. So they came, and they just, like, they just bamboozled Japan, and Japan left. But that was 1945. Anyways, following that, this dude named Ho Chi Minh, 
he was like, you know what? America's pretty cool. We're going to make our own country in Vietnam following the basis of America. We're going to quote the American Declaration of Independence, and we're going to make a mini America in Vietnam because we love America. And instead of being like, instead of America being like, oh my gosh, that's so cool that you like us, America was like, nah, man, you ain't France anymore, so we're going to fight you. Wait, so, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a whole thing. So instead of like supporting this country that like literally based their country off of America, they decided to fight it because of France. Like because France was their ally and France. Because didn't France like was them. their ally and France, yeah, and France, yeah, France was their ally and France was losing that call. And, yeah, because like, Southeast Asia was French at that point. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, and so. My one Vietnam, sentence on this makes three times more sense than anything that that whole paragraph said. Hey, I was describing you perfectly well, Josh. Daniel, um, that's my you point. Didn't say you didn't. Oh, okay. What's your sentence, Josh? No, oh, my oh, sentence was based. Uh, I'm talking about the paragraph in the chapter, Daniel. We're doing so good. I'm so tired. Yeah. Oh, no, Daniel. One we're all a little us, dead. Ding, ding, do. Anyway, sorry. Go. <laughs> we're, all, we're all a little dead. Ding, ding, do. Yes. Uh, after fresh troops are defeated at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. In May of 1954, U.S. officials helped broker a temporary settlement that partitioned Vietnam in two. Partition. A partition. Yeah. A you Soviet Chinese back state in the north and an American back state in the south. Very similar to what happened with uh, North Korea and South Korea. Uh, yeah, the stifle the communist expansions. Yeah. This co stifle communist expansions south. The United States would send arms, offer military advisors, prop up corrupt politicians, stop elections, and eventually send over 500,000 troops of whom nearly 60,000 would be lost before the communists finally reunified the country. So the U.S. actually lost that. Fun fact. But the U.S. never actually okay. declared it a war, so technically the U.S. didn't lose. But you know, yeah, they lost the war. They, yeah. <laughs> also, Ryan, you're up to read. Woo -woo. Yay! I was gonna ask. Okay, do you tell me when you want me to go. Hold on. Yeah, because I know folks like to write. Folks do like to write. Sure do be yeah. that way. Do. Ow. Okay, so, at what yeah. point do you think, like, think to yourself, well, China, Russia, and France are all helping this one country, and we're, like, kind of far away from this one country. So, why are we helping them? Which country are you talking about, Josh? Vietnam. France. Wait, wait, well, no, Russia, no, wait, that's that's wrong. Russia and China were on one side, and France is on the other side, and then yeah. the U.S. joined France's side, so it wasn't Russia, China, and yeah, France fr helping the out US Vietnam. The U.S. was in alliance with France, so that's why they took France's side. Wee oui, wee oui, wee, oui, monster baguette croissant. Okay. Uh -huh. But still. Uh -huh. But still what? I don't know. I guess. This is know, two of like the big. Things, two big superpowers against one big superpower in useless France. <laughs> <laughs> and As we also, we just War two. passed the longest section of the chapter, so congratulations, everybody. That's pretty cool. Hey. Yeah, but we're only a third of the way through it. You know what? We're gonna. We're, we got this. Don't even. Don't even worry. Okay. Go go go. Oh okay. Okay. The arms build up the space race and technological advancement. The world was never the same after the United States leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 with atomic bombs. Not only had perhaps 180,000 civilians had been killed, the nature of warfare was forever changed. The Soviets accelerated their nuclear research, expedited in no small part by atom spies such as Klaus uh, Fuchs, who had stolen nuclear secrets from the American secret Manhattan Project. Soviet scientists successfully tested an atomic bomb on August 29, 1949, years before American officials had estimated they would. This unexpectedly quick Russian success not only caught the United States off guard, but alarmed the Western world and propelled a nuclear arms race between the United States and the USSR. The United States detonated the first thermonuclear weapon, or hydrogen bomb, using fusion explosives of theoretically limitless power on November 1st, 1952. The blast measured over 10 megatons and generated an inferno 5 miles wide with a mushroom cloud 25 miles high and 100 miles across. <laughs> the irradiated- yeah, seriously. Um, the irradiated- <laughs> Oh gosh. From the blast circled the earth, occasioning international alarm about the effects of nuclear testing on human health and the environment. I just wrote an essay about this. Um, I did too. It only hastened the arms race, with each side developing increasingly advanced warheads and delivery systems. The USSR successfully tested a hydrogen bomb in 1953, 
And soon thereafter, Eisenhower announced a policy of massive retaliation. The United States would henceforth respond to threats or acts of aggression with perhaps an entire nuclear might. Both sides, then, would theoretically be deterred from starting a war through the logic of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. J. Robert Oppenheimer, director of the Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratory that developed the first nuclear bomb, I think that's in New Mexico, um, likened the state of nuclear deterrence between the United States and the USSR to two scorpions in a bottle, each capable of killing each other, but only by risking their own lives. This is a wild metaphor. <laughs> that's just worth that. That's like, that gives off Alden vibes. Just scorpions yeah, in a bottle. Two scorpions in a bottle. I kind of <laughs> like that seems like something Alden would do. Yeah. Okay. Fears of uh, nuclear war. Jack, sorry. I'm rereading it. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm not great at summarizing, so Daniel might be better if you want. No, it's fine. I'm I was just making sure I got everything that was important. Yeah, okay. I don't think it was that long. Why is section 3 so long? <laughs> it is really long. Like, right, I think, I think, I think you might. It's I not think actually that long, Daniel. Three it's like, section three. Yeah. They're all kind of long. Oh, whatever. I can like, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm I, sorry. I'm at section four. Section yeah, four, four section is long. Four. Three is kind of short. Section two and section four are long, so I think I might let Ryan do section four as well. <laughs> okay, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can read it. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, you're all and, then I'll, and then I'll do like the last one. <laughs> we should yeah, let Daniel fine. take notes, cause that'd be funny. <laughs> oh, you guys want to see me take notes? My notes would be so great to see. <laughs> That would be doesn't make sense to anyone else because he already knows most of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it'd be like literally. Like that. Yeah, I should have like some random account. fact that he doesn't know that he wants to remember or something. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it would literally just be that, and like even then, it'd probably be like pretty like, like basic. Or or pretty just make like you take notes on, and basically just summarize each paragraph. I could do that like just as easily as well. Yeah, actually. just like rewrite the whole book. I could legit just like do that. I could read. I could write a better text. Okay, anyway, keep reading, because sure we don't okay, have yeah. to watch this Okay. Fears of, nuclear I mean, I war. Fears of Nuclear War produced a veritable atomic culture. Films such as Godzilla, On the Beach, Failsafe, and Dr. Strangelove are how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, plumbed the depths of American anxieties with plots featuring radioactive monsters, nuclear accidents, and doomsday scenarios. Anti-nuclear protests in the United States and abroad warned against the perils of nuclear testing and highlighted the likelihood that a thermonuclear war would unleash a global uh, environmental catastrophe. Yet at the same time, peaceful nuclear technologies, such as fission and fusion-based energy, seem to herald a utopia of power that would be clean, safe, and too cheap to meter. In 1953, Eisenhower proclaimed at the UN that the United States would share the knowledge and means for other countries to use atomic power. Henceforth, the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. The Atoms for Peace speech brought about the establishment of the International e Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, that's all vowels, um, uh, yeah, along, yeah. Uh, along with worldwide investment in the new economic sector. IAEA. Okay, so Aia. Daniel, how long did that last? Uh, what, IAEA? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact dates, but I can almost guarantee not that long. Because uh. that would have been a bad idea. What, Aia? Yeah, sharing everything with everyone. Um, yeah, so that probably left within, like, the next, like, five years. Okay. Yeah, I doubt it. Oh my gosh, you guys are almost at NASA! Whoa! NASA! Okay. NASA! Nick Lee would be excited right now that Nick Lee's he not would be, here. But he's not here. Aww. He's a fool. Rip. Okay. Um, as Germany fell at the close of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union each sought to acquire elements of the Nazis' V-2 superweapon program. A devastating rocket that had terrorized England, the V-2 was capable of delivering its explosive payload up to a distance of nearly 600 miles, and both nations sought to capture the scientists, designs, and manufacturing equipment to make it work. The former top German rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, became the leader of the American space program. The Soviet Union's program was secretly managed by former prisoner Ser uh, Sergei Kor Korolev. After the end <gasps> of the war, <gasps> wait, 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 you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys. Do you like Sergei Korolev? I love the man. Okay, so the the town where my family's from is named Karayov. It's named after him, and like oh, wow. it was like a super secret, oh. like it was a super secret Soviet like town that just got declassified like in the late nineties. It was like the center of like the like Soviet like nu uh, or not nuclear the Soviet like space race, and so like. 
both of my grandparents worked in like the Soviet Space Force and like they like met like all like the astronauts and all the people. Whoa. Yeah. Very cool. So my grandfather has pictures of him with Sergei Kadagov and they're like Whoa. kind of decent friends. Huh. Wow. That's Dude, he knows a guy so, in the textbook. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, dog. Okay. After the end of the war, American and Soviet rocket engineering teams worked to adapt German technology in order to create an intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. Oh, those things. Yeah. The Soviets oh, achieved success rifle. first. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they, they even used the same launch vehicle on October 4th, 1957, to send Sputnik 1, the, first, the world's first human-made satellite, into orbit. It was a My grandfather worked on that. Again, victory. Oh my goodness, of course your grandpa did. I know, that's awesome. <laughs> uh. And my grandmother was like the, the head chemist that like made all like the like most for the fuel. Oh yeah, I think I knew that. Yeah. Are y'all good? Oh, one sec. Okay. Oh my gosh, I discovered chocolate. Damn. No. For the first time in your life? <laughs> I got chocolate. I want some. It's a good idea, Daniel. Chocolate break. <laughs> I've had two off-brand sprites. I had pasta. And <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Is everything's cool. Looks like Shelby tried to get into my chocolate. <laughs> my what? Where? I don't think she was successful. Shouldn't Shelby, like, not be eating chocolate? Yeah, chocolate's bad for dogs. Shelby, what are you doing? Hmm. Well, while we're taking this chocolate break, do you guys know the round-trip flights to Hawaii cost less than $200 right now? Yeah. What? Damn. Like, they cost- so sick. At the moment, they cost $89 for my latest research. Oh my goodness, the spring- For $89. Hawaii, <laughs> it's Corona time. I'm signed up for like, like an email take thing. That... Yeah, we should. Yeah. Just I'm signed up for like spring an email break. thing. Uh, Kaja's okay. actually going to Hawaii during spring break, so oh, like. Just go. <laughs> just go. Just go. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> they cost $300 to fly to Russia right now. I'm, like, I'm really tempted to take that off right now. Wow. Yeah, why not? Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> like, usually it's like $1,000, and it's only 300 Mm hmm. Anyways, chocolate breaks over. Time to read. Okay, okay. Um, in response, the U.S. government rushed to perfect its own ICBM technology and launch its own satellites and astronauts into space. In 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, was created as a successor to the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or uh, NACA. Um, initial, uh, sorry. Initial American attempts to launch a satellite into orbit using the Vanguard rocket suffered uh, spectacular failures, heightening fears of Soviet domination in space. While the American space program floundered, on September 13, 1959, the Soviet Union's Luna 2 capsule became the first human-made object to touch the moon. The race for survival, as it was called by the New York Times, reached a new level. The Soviet Union successfully launched a pair of dogs, Vilka and Strelka, into orbit and returned them to Earth. Oh, oh, <laughs> Vilka and Strelka! <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Vilka, they, they, they were in the same city, and, and my, my grandfather had pictures of him with Vilka and Strelka. They're, such, breath, cool, they're such cute little puppies, oh my gosh! <laughs> Space dogs! They're super cool. Space dogs. Space also, dogs. there's a super cool Russian propaganda movie of them, and like I love it so much. It was, it was like my favorite movie as a child. And, like, like it, it followed like the successful like events of them, and like it praised how like communism like succeeded in like putting the dogs in space. It's my favorite movie ever. That's awesome. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. Okay, so so they launched Falcon Strelka into orbit and returned. Falcon Strelka. Mm-hmm. While the American Mercury program languished behind schedule. Despite countless failures and one massive accident that killed nearly 100 Soviet military and rocket engineers, Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was launched into orbit on April 12, 1961. American astronaut Alan Shepard accomplished a suborbital flight in the Freedom 7 capsule on May 5th. The United States lagged behind, and John Kennedy would use America's losses in the space race to bolster funding for a moon landing. Um, well, outer space... Really what? Oh, the, yeah. 
There's no such thing as the moon. Um, while outer space captivated the world's imagination, the Cold War still captured its anxieties. The ever-escalating arms race continued to foster panic. In the early 1950s, the Federal Civil Defense Administration, or FCDA, began preparing citizens for the worst. School children were instructed via a film featuring Bert the Turtle. Sorry. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bert. I really like that as a detail. Um, to duck and cover beneath their desks. The event oh my goodness. I feel There's like a nuke coming. Go no duck and cover under your desk. I'm looking at Bert the Turtle right now. What's up? It's important. I really wish. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! There's a video of Bert the Turtle with like. There's probably one second. I have to see. The <laughs> there's a nine minute long video of Bert the Turtle oh describing goodness, what to do. With the <laughs> oh, it's actually a nice little sweet turtle. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, <laughs> Did you look it up also? Yeah, yeah he's a bow tie in a hat. Oh. Are you about to die from a nuclear weapon? Well, don't worry. Just do the Bert the Turtle method and you'll be all good. <laughs> Duck and cover, because that's going to help you from a nuclear weapon. Yeah, nope. your desks are uh, nuclear returnable. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um, although it took a back seat to space travel, yes, and and you, and you, um, the advent of modern computing was yet another major Cold War scientific innovation, the effects of which were only just beginning to be understood. In 1958, following the humiliation of the Sputnik launches, Eisenhower authorized the creation of an Advanced Research Projects Ag Agency, or ARPA, housed within the Department of Defense, later changed to DARPA. <laughs> DARPA. <laughs> DARPA. Um, as a secretive military research and development operation, uh, ARPA was tasked with funding and otherwise overseeing the production of sensitive new technologies. Soon, in cooperation with university-based computer engineers, uh, ARPA would develop the first series, sorry, the world's first system of network packing switches, and computer networks would begin connecting to one another. Oh, that's dank. I want to look into that. that yeah. Cool. That's it. That's the end of the section. Heck yeah. That's space, baby. Go team. Go team. Go space. All right, Ryan, you're up for the next section, and I'll take section five and six. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. These section titles are so creative. The Cold okay. War, Red Scare, McCarthyism, and Liberal Anti-Communism. What? Sure God is. Okay, um, do you want me to just go now? Um, one sec. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did we Get talk it. about Joseph McCarthy yet? We're about well, we're to. about to. Joseph right. McCarthy, there he is. That's a photo of him. There he is. It sure go. is a photo of him. Oh. Go yeah, Joseph about McCarthy. It. Joseph McCarthy, Republican senator from Wisconsin, fueled fears during the early 1950s that communism was rampant and growing. This intensified Cold War tensions felt by every segment of society, from government officials to ordinary American citizens. There's my image reading. Very good. The, the image isn't even on the live. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Daniel, oh my goodness. What? Why is it so laggy for me? It's Daniel, not laggy. It's laggy it's for everyone. I'll just, okay, I'll stop. Even if people can't see it, Nick read it so well that they can picture it in their heads. <laughs> he looks like a president. He does look like a president. He, he looks like, um... He goes off those president vibes. I mean, he's a senator, so... Yeah. No, but he looks... I mean, he's got, like, five microphones in front of him. Yeah, what was the thing with multiple microphones? Could they, like, every not... newspaper wanted their own. Yeah, every recording. single newspaper yeah, wants its own newspaper. Yeah, like they have like different like. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yup. Okay. Um, Joseph McCarthy time, baby. Okay. Burst onto uh, the national scene. Yes, Joseph McCarthy burst onto the national scene <laughs> during a speech in Wheeling, West Virginia, on February 9th, nineteen fifty. Waving a sheet of paper in the air, he proclaimed, "I have here in my hand a list of two hundred and five <laughs> names." They were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party, and who nevertheless are still working and shaping U.S. policy. Since the Wisconsin Republican had no actual list when pressed, the number changed, <laughs> the number changed to 57, then later 81. <laughs> yes, perfect. <laughs> Finally, he promised to disclose the name of just one communist, the nation's top <laughs> Soviet agent. The shifting numbers brought ridicule, but it didn't matter. McCarthy's claims won him fame and filled the ongoing red scare. So basically, this guy just completely made something up, and it didn't matter. No one cared. <laughs> Whoa. He's just fine. Good politics. You right? Politics. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Since he had no actual list. Um, okay. 
I love that so much. She waves a paper around without like it was goes off. I wonder what's on the. It would have been really funny if it was a blank piece of paper and people. Still yeah. It was. It literally was. There was, was nothing on blank? the paper. Yeah, it was just a piece of paper. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I have the list. Yeah. McCarthyism was a symptom of a massive and widespread anti-communist hysteria that engulfed Cold War America. Popular fears, for instance, had long since shot through the federal government. Only two years after World War II, President Truman, facing growing anti-communist excitement and with a tough election on the horizon, gave in to pressure on, in March 1947 and issued his loyalty order, Executive Order 9835, <laughs> establishing loyalty reviews for federal employees. The FBI conducted closer examinations of all potential security risks among foreign service officers. In Congress, the House Un-American Activities Committee... <laughs> Un-American <laughs> Activities. Come on. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, and the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, SPSI, held hearings on communist influence in American society. Wait a second. Okay. <laughs> I just have to copy all that in. You okay? <laughs> okay. Dank, continue. Yeah. The abbreviation for the for HUAC is HWAC. Um, HWAC. HWAC. Um, HWAC. Yeah. <laughs> between 1949 and 1954, uh, congressional committees conducted over 100 investigations into subsur subversive activities. Anti-subversion committees emerged in over a dozen state legislators, legislatures and review procedures proliferated in public schools and universities across the country. At the University of California, for example, hey, uh, 31 professors were dismissed in 1950 for refusing to sign a loyalty oath. The Internal Security Act, or McCarran Act, passed by Congress in September 1950, mandated all communist organizations to register with the government, gave the government greater powers to investigate sedition, and made it possible to prevent suspected individuals from gaining or keeping their citizenship. Well, hmm. What is a communist organization in this Context. You know, just those that are like, Communism. we fully support Russia, and we're also in the United States, and we're public about it, too. <laughs> yeah, is it just like, <laughs> if you have a club, you have to tell the government? That's exactly how it is. Huh, alright. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anti-communist policies reflected national fears of a surging global communism. Within a ten-month span, beginning in 1949, for instance, the USSR developed a nuclear bomb, China fell to communism, and over 300,000 American soldiers were deployed to fight in a land war in Korea. Newspapers, meanwhile, were filled with headlines alleging Soviet espionage. Uh, during the war, during the war, Julius Rosenberg worked briefly at the U.S. Army Signal Corps Library in New Jersey, where he had access to classified information. He and his wife, Ethel, who had both been members of the Communist Party of the USA, CPUSA, in the 1930s were accused of passing secret bomb related documents to soviet officials and were indicted indicted That's yeah yeah in august 1950 on charges of giving nuclear secrets to the russians after a trial in march 1951 they were found guilty and executed on june 19 1953 mm, what year was it again oh 1953 okay yeah so i have another complaint about her textbook hmm. I, I don't know for sure, but like, mm. okay, I don't know, but the textbook ne never gives anything concrete. It's like, they could have given out classified information, but we're not going to really well, yeah, accuse we, them because... We don't actually know, that's why. Yeah, but, I mean... But no, but I'm just saying it's a major theme within the book. They're like, it could have happened, well, yeah, and then this bad thing is. happened. I just, as funny I mean, as it is, a lot of it's especially pretty unsure. Lot is. Like, with the government policy, it's like, with this case, it's just like, we don't know. Yeah, it's, it's all, <laughs> I mean, all been made up. It writes it vaguely, because it's kind of vague, like, as a situation. I don't know. <laughs> I do get what you mean, though, and it's I just don't vague, like learning like, about it if it's, like, kind of vague and... Yeah. yeah that makes sense. No, yeah. it's understandable. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a reason it's like that. Um, okay. Uh, uh, out... Mm, Alger, Alger Hiss, let's go with that. Alger Hiss, the highest ranking <laughs> government happened? official linked to Soviet espionage, was another prize for conservatives. Hiss was a prominent official in the U.S. State Department and served as Secretary General of the U.N. Charter Conference in San Francisco from April to June 1945 before leaving the State Department in 1946. A young congressman and member of HUAC, Richard Nixon, you know him, 
made waves by his by accusing his of espionage. On August 3rd, 1948, Whitaker Chambers testified before HUAC that he and Hiss had worked together as part of the secret communist underground in Washington, D.C. during the 1930s. Hiss, who always maintained his innocence, stood trial twice. After a hung jury in July 1949, he was convicted on two counts of perjury, the statute of limitations for espionage having expired. Later evidence suggested their guilt. At the time, their convictions fueled an anti-communist frenzy, and some began seeing communists everywhere. Sorry, I hear a lot of typing, so I feel like you should probably pause. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry, I don't I think of any bits to fill that space with. Um, okay. Uh, Albert <laughs> Hiss and the Rosenbergs offered anti-communists so, so, such as Joseph McCarthy the evidence the sorry blah, the evidence they needed to allege a vast Soviet conspiracy to infiltrate and subvert the U.S. government and justify the smearing of all left liberals, even those who were resolutely anti-communist. Not long after his February 1950 speech in Wheeling. McCarthy's sensational charges became a source of growing controversy. Forced to respond, President Truman arranged a partisan congressional investigation designed to discredit McCarthy. The Tidings Committee held hearings from early March through July 1950 and issued a final report admonishing McCarthy for perpetuating a fraud and a hoax on the American public, which he like, absolutely did. Um, <laughs> American progressives saw McCarthy's crusade as nothing less than a political witch hunt. In June 1950, the Nation magazine editor, Frida Kurtway, characterized McCarthyism as the means by which a handful of men, disguised as hunters of subversion, cynically subvert the instruments of justice in order to help their own political opinions. Truman's liberal supporters, and leftists like Kurtway, hoped in vain that McCarthy and the new ism that bore his name would blow over quickly. There had, of course, been a communist presence in the United States. The CPUSA was found was formed in the aftermath of the 1917 Russian Revolution. The Bolsheviks created a communist international, the Common Turn, uh, and invited invited socialists from around the world to join. During its first two years of existence, the CPUSA functioned in secret, hidden from a surge of anti-radical and anti-immigrant hysteria, investigations, deportations, and raids at the end of World War One. The CPUSA began its public life in 1921, after the panic subsided. subsided but communism remained on the margins of American life until the 1930s, when leftists and liberals began to see the Soviet Union as a symbol of hope amid the Great Depression. Then many communists joined the Popular Front, an effort to make uh, communism mainstream by adapting it to American history and American culture. During the Popular Front era, communists were integrated into mainstream political institutions through alliances with progressives in the Democratic Party. The CPUSA enjoyed most of its influence and popularity among workers in unions linked to the newly formed CIO. It doesn't say what that is. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say what the CIO stands for. Um, uh, communists also became strong opponents of uh, Jim Crow segregation present in both the NAACP and the ACLU. Uh, I guess you're supposed to know what that is. Um, <laughs> yeah, the ACLU is the... Um... Right. Was American thing? Civil Liberties thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. NAACP, I feel like I should know, but I don't. Yeah, whatever. National um, American Association of Workers or Corporate Cop. <laughs> <laughs> Something. Yeah. The Association of. <laughs> um, <laughs> the CPUSA, moreover, established front groups such as the League of American Writers in which intellectuals participated without even knowing of its ties to the common term. But even at the height of the global economic crisis, communism never attracted many Americans. Even at the peak of its membership, the CPUSA had just 80,000 national card-carrying members. From the mid-1930s through the mid-1940s, uh, the party exercised most of its power indirectly through coalitions with liberals and reformers. When news broke of Hitler's and Stalin's 1939 non-aggression, many fled the party feeling betrayed. A block of left liberal anti-communists, meanwhile, heard remaining communists in the ranks, and the Popular Front collapsed. 
uh, lacking the legal grounds to abolish the CPUSA, Wait, officials. Second, oh, sorry. Wait a sec. Yeah. Uh, What was the popular front? Uh, the popular front was an effort to make communism mainstream by adapting it into American history and American culture. Wow. That's the one. Communism get hit with the kids. It's too big in the size. Hank. Yep. National American Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Thank you, Amatil. Yeah, <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, okay, what is the popular front? I know, you just explained I just it. Told he just told you. I know, and I'm trying to write it down and I forget already. <laughs> An effort to make communism mainstream by adapting it to American history and American culture. Essentially, they took American culture and... Yeah, You're trying to make it... Like I don't know. Do you usually do this where it's just like silent for a minute? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I was supposed to be doing something. I mean, no, you can if you want to. Notes. And it's even if harder for us to it, focus. So it's like yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, theoretically, like Amatil's trying to take notes too or something. I don't know. Yeah. Who okay. knows? Amatil, are you trying to take notes? Seconds wait later. 30 seconds for <laughs> yeah, gotta, gotta wait for that stream delay, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, are you ready, Josh? Yeah. Dang. Okay. Is Daniel like here? I don't think it um, matters. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess he's not taking notes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, right. Lacking the legal grounds to abolish the CPUSA, officials instead sought to expose and contain CPUSA influence. Following a series of predecessor committees, HUAC was established in 1938, then reorganized after the war and given the explicit task of investigating communism. By the time the Communist Control Act was passed in, 19, sorry, in August 1954, effectively criminalizing party membership, the CPUSA had long ceased to have meaningful influence. Anti-communists were driven to eliminate remaining CPUSA influence from progressive institutions, including the NAACP and the CIO. The Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 gave union officials the initiative to purge communists from the labor movement. A kind of Cold War liberalism took hold. In, in January 1947, anti-communist liberals formed Americans for Democratic Action (ADA), whose founding members included labor leader Walter Ruther and NAACP chairman Walter White, as well as historian Arthur uh, Schlesinger Jr. Theologian Reinhold Niebuhr and former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, working to help Truman defeat former Vice President Henry Wallace's popular front backed campaign in 1948, the ADA combined social and economic reforms with staunch anti communism. Americans for Democratic Communism. Bum, bum. Nice, Daniel. You're welcome. Okay, that last section. Need a jingle. Communism. Boom. Um. Good. We good? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. We good. On a scale of good to good, we're good. Yeah. I think my notes make no sense, but really, I don't even care. And oh, you know shoot, what? I have, a, I, have, I have a math test. <laughs> I feel like I have something tomorrow and I forgot what it was, but it's fine. Oh, Amatil is taking notes, cool. Oh, he is? Okay, cool. Yeah, Amatil is epic. Amatil, you're our number Amatil, one. Man. We love you, Amatil. I've never met him, but he's a G. Amatil is epic. You've never met Amatil. I'm last stream, but. He's yeah, Estrella usually, Estrella usually stays, but we started too late for her. Well, and so Estrella, Estrella, was, Estrella yeah. was doing a lot of other things. I was like, hey, you want to come on the. Like, um... <laughs> yeah, I texted the same thing also. Usually, usually, when, like, usually if we start, like, on time and we're not, like, live streaming at 10 p.m., we get more people watching. Literally 10 p.m. Yeah, so, yeah. like, I'm totally fine with having five viewers right now, because we're, like, we're just, like, doing this late next yeah. week. How many Hopefully. do you usually have? 
We had like 13 or 14 last time at, at oh, wow. peak, more like usually like an average of 10. Yeah, that's still, that's a lot. It was nice, yeah, and hopefully like once we get Ambrose, like I we have to talk to her actually. Nick, we should talk to her tomorrow about like figuring out like details. No. But also, we just went up to six as soon as we started talking about Oh, but you said us a heart. Oh my gosh, I'll let you a heart back. I don't, I don't know how to send you a heart back, but I'm giving you a heart back. It's all right. I'll send him a heart back for you, Daniel. I did. Nick. Yay. <laughs> also. Very nice. <laughs> heart, Daniel. That's so wholesome. Awesome for me. This is the wholesome <laughs> content that we're. Okay. <laughs> This is right here. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Alright. Um, sometimes you gotta send love to the bros, dude. You just, um, you do, man. Yeah. Send love to the boys. Okay. Uh, the domestic Cold War was bipartisan, fueled by a consensus drawn from a left liberal and conservative anti-communist alliance that included politicians and policymakers, journalists and scientists, business and civic religious leaders, and educators and, engin- and entertainers. Uh, Led by its... <laughs> yeah, everybody, basically. Um, led by its imperious director, J. Edgar Hoover. Oh, that guy. Uh, the FBI yeah. took Mr. An Hoover! Active... Yeah, that guy. Uh, the FBI took an active role in the domestic battle against communism. Hoover's FBI helped incite panic by assisting in the creation of uh, blatantly propagandistic films and television shows, including The Red Menace in 1949, My Son John in 1951, and I Led Three Lives from 1953 to 1956. Uh, such alarmist descriptions, sorry, depictions of espionage and treason in a free world imperiled by communism heightened the 1950s culture of fear. In the fall of 1949, sorry, 47, uh, HUAC entered the fray with highly publicized hearings of Hollywood. Film mogul Walt Disney and actor Ronald Reagan, huh? Whoa. Um, Ronald Reagan was an actor. Yeah, that was. There you go. Everything. Um, I didn't know that at all. Uh among others, testified to aid investigators' attempts to expose communist influence in the entertainment industry. A group of writers, directors, and producers who refused to answer questions were held in contempt of Congress. This Hollywood 10 created the precedent for a blacklist in which hundreds of film artists were barred from industry work for the next decade. I don't know did know it did that. I didn't know that. Okay. Yee. Uh, yee. Uh, HUAC made repeated visits to Hollywood during the 19th 19- and their interrogation of celebrities often began with the same intimidating refrain, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Many witnesses cooperated and named names, naming anyone they knew who had ever been associated with communist-related groups or organizations. In 1956, black entertainer and activist Paul Robeson- Robeson? Uh, chided his HUAC inquisitors, claiming they had put him on trial not for his politics, but because he had spent his life fighting for the rights of his people. You were the un-Americans, he told them, and you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. As Robeson and other victims, you know, right? As Robeson and other victims of McCarthyism learned firsthand, the second Red Scare, when the blow of nuclear annihilation and global totalitarianism, totalitarianism, sorry, uh, fueled an intolerant and skeptical political world. What Cold War liberal Arthur Schlesinger in the vital in his The Vital Center, nineteen forty nine, called an age of anxiety. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, all right, I took like no notes on that, so we'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anti-communist ideology valorized overt patriotism, religious conviction, and faith in capitalism. Of course. Um. Those who shunned such American values were open to attack. If communism was a plague spreading across Europe and Asia, anti-communist hyperbole infected cities, towns, and suburbs throughout the country. The playwright Arthur Miller's Oh book my gosh! The communist boy. I, well, it's not really my boy. I hated both of them that I read of his. But, um, <laughs> I sure have read them. Um, the playwright Arthur Miller's popular 1953 play, The Crucible, compared the Red Scare to the Salem Witch Trials. Oh, that's that was about communism? <laughs> you guys didn't know that? Yeah, I compared it to, well, cause like... I just, I just fell asleep during the thing. I literally fell asleep. Like... <laughs> yeah, I did too. Like, oh, well, I mean, I came in, like, late, and then I just got so bored that I just, like, yeah, I just made you off. Horrifically boring. I had no idea. Alright, whatever. Um, okay, uh, Miller wrote, In America, any man who is not reactionary in his views 
is open to the charge of alliance within the with the Red Hell. Political uh, opposition thereby is given an inhumane overlay, which then justifies the abrogation of all normally applied customs of civilized intercourse. A lot of buzzwords. A political policy is equated with right and opposition to it with diabolical malevolence. Wow. Once such, yeah, right? Uh, once such an equation is effectively made, society becomes a, a congery. I don't know what that word is. Congery. No, I don't Con- know. Congery. Congery. Um, of plots and counterplots, and the main rule of government changes from that of the arbiter to that of the scourge of God. Scourge oh my gosh. God. Jesus, scourge man. Of, the scourge of God. He really was a playwright, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that he was. Hey, uh, rallying against communism, American society urged conformity. Deviant behavior became dangerous. Having entered the workforce en masse as part of the collective effort in World War II, Middle-class women were told to return to housekeeping responsibilities. Having fought and died abroad for de- American democracy, black soldiers were, return- were told to return home and acquiesce to the American racial order. Homosexuality, already stigmatized, became dangerous. That's Personal right. Se- Boy, howdy. <laughs> <laughs> Personal secrets were seen as a liability that exposed one to black men. The same paranoid mindset that fueled the second red scare also ignited the Cold War lavender scare against gay Americans. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. Um, when did, hey Daniel, you know presidents. When was uh, when did Reagan get in office? Uh, eighties, I think. Yeah, okay. So I not for like remember. not for like another thirty years. Yeah, not for a while. Okay. Um. Okay. Sorry, that had nothing to do with anything. I just forgot. That's true. <laughs> Okay, uh, American religion, meanwhile, was fixated on what McCarthy, in his 1950 Wheeling speech, called an all-out battle between communist, communistic atheism, ah, sorry, communistic atheism and Christianity. Cold warriors in the United States routinely referred to a fundamental incompatibility between godless communism and God-fearing Americanism. Religious conservatives championed the idea of the traditional nuclear God-fearing family as a bulwark against the spread of atheistic totalitarianism. God, that word has gotten me twice tonight. <laughs> um, as Baptist minister Billy Graham sermonized in 1950, communism aimed to destroy the American home and cause moral deterioration, leaving the country exposed to communist infiltration. In an atmosphere in which ideas of national belonging and citizenship were so closely linked to religious commitment, Americans during the early Cold War years attended a church, possessed a belief in, super- in a supreme being, and stressed the importance of religion in their lives at higher rates than at any time in American history. Huh. Uh, Americans sought to differentiate themselves from godless communists through public displays of relig- relig- religiousness. Um, <laughs> religiosity. <laughs> the, what I've never heard that word, and it's, it's probably completely unnecessary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, politicians infused government with religious symbols. The Pledge of Allegiance was altered to include the words One Nation Under God in 1954. Huh. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. That's interesting. I didn't know yeah, that, that is interesting. Huh, okay. Um, and God We Trust was adopted as the national, the official national motto Oh, I didn't 19- know that either. Huh. I didn't know Whoa. that either. I feel like I probably still know the Pledge of Allegiance because I went to kindergarten. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States, of States of America, America. Uh, and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, uh, or, uh, liberty and justice yeah. for all. Y'all are there you go. great. <laughs> I think we all knew that. <laughs> and now it's time for the baseball game to begin. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's not. Oh, that's uh, why I know that. <laughs> no, that's a different song. <laughs> yeah, still. Um, that, actually. Sports is absolutely why I know all the words of Carson Um Okay, anyways. Um, in God We Trust was adopted... Right, so I read that. Uh, in popular culture, one of the most popular films of the decade, The Ten Commandments, 1956, retold the biblical Exodus story as a Cold War parable. What? Echoing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> echoing, incidentally, in... in uh, oh, yes, Carmat Moses. R- released <laughs> Release the nuclear weapons and <laughs> what? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Comrade Moses, um, echoing incidentally, uh, NSC 68's characterization of the Soviet Union as a slave state. Monuments of the Ten Commandments met up at courthouses and city halls across the country. Uh, Josh, it's not, that's illegal now, right? What is? Having like religious Ten Commandments on like 
government property. Like, oh, that's kind of whack, yeah. Probably? Josh, you have been breathing into the microphone for the past paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really me? Yeah, it's a... <laughs> yes. I hate it. That was noticeable to me. <laughs> I don't but know. Discord doesn't show it's happening. Okay, well, but it was. <laughs> but it's bad. Okay, fine, I'll move my mic. Is that better? Josh, I like the sound of your breathing. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have you breathing than not breathing. I mean, well, that like, is yeah, true. but directly into the microphone. Dang. Oh boy. Oh boy. Okay, are we good? Yeah. We good. Alright, All right, uh, while the link between American national much closer during the Cold War, many Americans began to believe that just believe that just believing in almost any religion was better than being an atheist. Gone was the overt anti Catholic and anti Semitic language of Protestants in the past. Oh, that's cool. Now, yeah. Uh, now leaders spoke of a common Judeo Christian heritage. In December 1930, 19, sorry, 1952, a month before his inauguration, Dwight Eisenhower said that our form of government makes no sense unless it is founded in a deeply felt religious faith, and I don't care what it is. Huh, that's nice. that's kind of uh, chill. Yeah, that's, that's like, cooler than I expect. Um, <laughs> go Dwight! Go, Dwight! Let's go Dwight, Dwight dog! Um, Joseph McCarthy, an Irish Catholic, made common <laughs> cause with... <laughs> prominent religious anti-communist, including Southern uh, evangelist Billy James Hargis of a Christian of oh, sorry of Christian Crusade, a popular radio and television ministry that peaked in the 1950s and 1960s. Who is typing so hard that it's like oh, rattling? Daniel's my the computer. only one that you can hear. He's typing you right now, probably. Oh, good <laughs> lord. Okay. Um. Wait, how do you know that? Because Amatil sent a message type and your so keyboard loud. is. So incredibly loud. Like, it sounds like... Let me move my microphone a little closer for demonstration purposes. Actually, let me put it over the keyboard. <clears throat> Does that help, Daniel? <laughs> Daniel's is still worse. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so unfortunate having a good microphone so you guys can't hear my keyboard horribly. <laughs> Terrifying, all of you. Pounding more over there. Um, uh, where we? uh, Cold oh, yeah, War okay. religion. Yeah. Cold War religion in America also crossed the political divide. <clears throat> uh, during the 1952 campaign, Eisenhower spoke of U.S. foreign policy as a war of light against darkness, freedom against slavery, godliness against atheism. His Democratic opponent, former Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson, said Illinois. that America... No, stop <laughs> it. Not in this household said that America was engaged in a battle with the Antichrist. Nice. Oh my god, wait, wait what? <laughs> nice. Huh. Um, did, he, did he just call his opponent the Antichrist? No, I think he called communism the Antichrist. But yeah, that's it's still, opponent. Hell yeah. It's still, it's still his um, when, while Billy Graham became the spiritual advisor to Eisenhower as well as American and Democratic presidents, the same was true of the liberal Protestant Reinhold Niebuhr, perhaps the nation's most important the theologist Theolo uh, Theologian. Theologian. Thank you. When he Theologian. appeared on, <laughs> I don't know. When he appeared okay. on the cover of Life in March 1948. Wait, who's Reinhold Niebuhr? He was. Theologian. The, we said him earlier. Really? And I forgot who he was. He's not important. <laughs> He's not important. It's fine. Sick. I'm just gonna ignore that entire paragraph. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh. Oh my god, how- I am losing what? steam here, folks. Okay. Um... You, are, you, are, you almost do the section and I'm gonna take up- oh, I actually- I'm gonna take up for you. You're an old man and I know it's past your bedtime. But shut up, Nick. <laughs> it's past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you were at- uh, where were you at? Through, though publicly rebuked. Though publicly rebuked. I know where I am. I know where I am. Um, you know where you are. Yeah, I- I got it, I got it. Hey, uh, the, the public were rebuked by the Tidings Committee, McCarthy soldiered on. In June 1951, on the floor of Congress, McCarthy charged the then-Secretary of Defense and former Secretary of State General, George Marshall, had fallen, no, we prey, to... That guy. Yeah. had fallen prey to a conspiracy on a scale so immense as to dwarf any previous such venture in the history of man. 
He claimed that Marshall, a war hero, had helped to diminish the United States in world affairs, enabling the United States to, fall, to finally fall victim to Soviet intrigue and Russian military might. The speech caused an uproar. During the 1952 campaign, Eisenhower, who was in all things moderate and politically cautious, refused to publicly denounce McCarthy. I will not get into the gutter with that guy, he wrote Berman. <laughs> <laughs> with that fool. Um, McCarthy campaigned for Eisenhower on a stunning victory. I really like, I will not get into the gutter with that guy. I really like that. I will not get into the gutter with that guy. With that guy. Um, <laughs> it's like, get your mind out of the gutter. Yeah. Uh, uh, so did the Republicans who regained Congress. McCarthy became chairman of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, PSI. Uh, he turned his newfound power uh, against the government's overseas broadcast division, the Voice of America, VOA. McCarthy's investigation in February to March 1953 resulted in several resignations or transfers. McCarthy's uh, mudslinging had become increasingly unrestrained. It's a good word. Um, I know these monthly. gutter and mud. They're just like they're going down. They have a theme. Yeah. Wait, is the SPSI theme. important? The um, SPSI. Oh, the Senate um, Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. I you could write it down because it's an acronym, but like I doubt it's not important. Dang, there are too many that. acronyms. I don't really care if I. Don't so it's not really then. I don't think. Yeah, it's there are like a thousand acronyms. I don't think that one. Um. Cool. Uh, soon he went after the U.S. Army. After forcing the army to again disprove theories of Soviet spy ring at Fort Monmouth in New Jersey, McCarthy publicly berated officers suspected of promoting leftists. McCarthy's badgering of witnesses created cover for critics to publicly denounce his abrasive fear-mongering. Uh, on March 9th, CBS anchor Edward R. Murray, a respected journalist, told his television audience that McCarthy's actions had caused alarm and dismay amongst allies, ab allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. Yet, Murrow explained, he didn't create the situation of fear, he merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Uh, ca Cassius? Ca was right. Cassius? Uh, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars. <laughs> that, was so so, that was so dramatic. The fault, dear dramatic. Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. I have no idea. Uh, they, they don't introduce what? Cassius at all, they just, they no just mention Cassius. <laughs> Cassius was right. Well, actually, is there more Cassius? I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can find Cassius again. No, there's literally just one Cassius. What? They never mentioned Cassius before that. Cassius no was right idea. there. Is Cassius that's, like That's a... just what he said. He was a Roman what... senator in general. We're supposed to, like, know about some Roman dude. I don't know. Obviously. I thought that's just a popular quote from him. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Sick. Oh, boy. Right. Does everybody um, know who Cassius is? Did you know? They sure do. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, 20 million. <laughs> What's what? happening? Sorry, in the background there. Uh huh. It sounds like somebody's just like clapping a water bottle. Thank you, Dana. Oh, wait, you guys can hear this? <laughs> yes! It's the worst! <laughs> oh, sorry. Daniel, look at Discord, and if there's a little bubble around your name. That means we can hear whatever's going on. What are you doing? There's always a little bubble around my name. Because you're so ah! always doing something. What are you doing? That wasn't me. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. What were you doing before that? I was pl I was playing with my water bottle. Listen, uh... I'm just going to read this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. That's okay. Uh, 20 million people saw the Army of McCarthy hearings. Daniel. You can't just key smash while I'm yelling, talking. Um, uh, uh, okay, uh, 20 million people saw the Army McCarthy hearings unfold over 36 days in 1954. The Army's head counsel, Joseph Welch, captured much of the mood of the country, and he defended a fellow lawyer from McCarthy's public smears, saying, let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> let us not enough. Don't kill him anymore. <laughs> Let us not assassinate this lad. Uh, have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? In September, a Senate subcommittee reminded that McCarthy be sent to <laughs> Uh, On December, December 2nd, 1954, his colleagues voted se uh, 67 to 22 to condemn his actions. Humiliated, McCarthy faded into irrelevance and alcoholism and died. <laughs> 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 That's not funny. 
funny. <laughs> Uh, Sorry. Age, 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 age 1957 and age 48. Jesus. Oh, God. Um, oh, boy. Of I mean, I guess that's what happens when you just wave a piece of paper in front of people and go, ah, Russia. <laughs> <laughs> just, like, your entire and, and it's an empty piece of the, the blank. Yeah. With nothing it wasn't like it. blank. It was. It was I reread it. It said it didn't have, like, info on it. Yeah, it didn't have information on it. About it didn't have names on it, but it had information. On it. If he's waving around just like a, the like the newspaper funnies from that day, I'd say it's. Um, oh boy. Okay. Uh, by the late 1950s, the worst of the Second Red Scare was over. Stalin's death, fire, uh, followed by the Korean War armistice, opened new space and hope for easing of Cold War tensions. Uh, d uh, d I don't care. Detente. <laughs> <laughs> and the F peoples of the late 1960s were on the horizon. But McCarthyism outlasted McCarthy in the 1950s. The, ta the tactics he perfected continued to be practiced long after his death. Red baiting, the act of smearing a political opponent by linking them to communism or some other demonized I ideology, persevered. That Why still happens have to this day. Ooh. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, but McCarthy <laughs> had hardly been alone. Uh, Congressman Richard Nixon, you know him, uh, for instance, had used his place on HUAC and his public role in the campaign oh, against Alger, Alger Hiss to catapult himself into the White House alongside Eisenhower and later into the presidency. Ronald Reagan boist, bolstered the fame that he had won in Hollywood with testimony before Congress and his anti-communist work for major American corporations such as General Electric. He too would use anti-communism to enter public life and chart a course to the presidency. In 1958, radical anti-communists founded the John Birch Society, attacking liberals and civil rights activists such as Martin Luther oh, King Jr. as communists. Um, you can just say words, they don't have to mean anything. Um, although joined by Cold War liberals, the weight of anti-communism was used as part of an assault against the New Deal and its defenders. Even those liberals, such as historian Arthur Schle uh, Schlesinger, who had fought against communism, found themselves smeared by the Red Scare. Leftist American tradition was in tatters, destroyed by anti-communist hysteria. Movements for social justice, from civil rights to gay rights to feminism, were all suppressed under Cold War conformity. If I have to listen to my own voice at all tonight, like any more, I will explode. You guys, <clears throat> lucky for you, you guys get to hear my voice now. <clears throat> Yay. Oh boy. All I right. Like Y'all ready for this? I'm ready for sleep, but that's not happening because I still have to read that gay push. You could do what? I feel like. What? Okay. I feel like sleep is a good idea as well. Oh, I'm not actually going to. I just. It's for the weak. We do not sleep, Josh. Josh, you know this. Sleeping is for nerds. We are not nerds. As long as we still got Amatil, we've got to keep going. We still have Amatil. <laughs> we must persevere. Alright, Roman numeral 5. Decolonization and the global reach of the American century. In an influential 1941 Life magazine editorial titled The American Century, publishing magnet Henry Luce outlined his vision of America as the principal guarantor of freedom of the seas and the dynamic leader of world know. trade. In What's his happening? embrace of an American-led international system, the conservative loose was joined by liberals, including historian Arthur Schlesinger, who in 1941, the, who in his 1949 Cold War tome, The Vital Center, proclaimed that a world destiny had been thrust upon the United States, with perhaps no other nation becoming a more reluctant great power. Emerging from the war as the world's preeminent military and economic force, the United States was perhaps destined to compete with the Soviet Union for influence in the Third World, where a power vacuum had been created by the demise of European imperialism. As France and Britain in particular struggled in vain to control colonies in Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, the United States assumed responsibility for maintaining order and producing a kind of Pax Americana. Little of the post-war world, however, will be so peaceful. <coughs> All right, what voice should I do now? I'm gonna do a regular Daniel voice. Based on the logic of militarized containment established by NSC-68 and American Cold War strategy, interventions in Korea and Vietnam were seen as appropriate American responses to the ascent of communism in China. 
Unless Soviet power in Asia was halted, Chinese influence would ripple across the continent, and one country after another would fall to communism. Easily transposed onto any region of the world, the domino theory became a standard basis for the justification of the U.S. interventions abroad. Cuba was seen- Oh my gosh, it's Cuba! Cuba was seen as a communist beachland, uh, beachhead that imperiled Latin America, uh, the Caribbean, and perhaps eventually the United States. Scandalous. Like Ho Chi Minh, Cuban leader Fidel Castro was a revolutionary nationalist whose career as a communist began in earnest after his rebuffed by the United States. And American interventions uh, target uh, wait. yeah, and American interventions target nations that never espoused official communist positions. Many interventions in Asia, Latin America, and elsewhere were driven by factors that are shaped by but also transcended anti-communist ideology. Nick, it's time for you to quickly uh, narrate a picture. Okay, one second. I have to write about Mr. Fidel. Fidel Mr. Castro. Fidel. Got it. Okay. Look at these dudes walking. First off, we're going to do an image analysis of the image. So here we see five men in the front and many more behind walking down a street. On a sign in the back, you can see it says Ferreteria Rodriguez something. Fernandez. Uh, there it is. <laughs> 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 Uh, it's actually probably Jimenez. Probably. Uh, the Cuban Revolution seemed to confirm the fears of many Americans that the spread of communism would, could not be stopped. In this photograph, Castro and fellow revolutionary Che Guevara march in a memorial for those killed in the explosion of a ship unloading munitions in Havana in March 1960. The U.S. government had been active in undermining Castro's regime, regime, and although there was no evidence in this instance, Castro publicly blamed the United States Spicy for the explosion. Man. Two hours? Is it two hours? Uh. Ah, we're almost done. No. Castro blamed U.S. for explosion. I already knew this. Whatever. Oh, we're like legit almost done. We have like one little section left. All right. Time for me to zoom through this. You guys ready? Yeah. We're doing the Daniel Fast method. <clears throat> Scary. Scary. I could add Russian accents, but I'm not going to. I'm s I'll spare you the pain. Um, instead of the United States dismantling its military after World War II, as it had after every major conflict, the Cold War facilitated a new permanent defense establishment. Federal investments in national defenses uh, affected the entire country. Different regions housed various sectors of what sociologist C. Wright Mills in 1956 called the permanent war economy. The aerospace industry was concentrated in areas like Southern California and Long Island, New York. Massachusetts was home to several universities that received major defense contracts. The Midwest became home base for intercontinental ballistic missiles pointed at the Soviet Union. Many of the largest defense companies and military installations were concentrated in the South. So much so that in 1956, author William Faulkner, who was born in Mississippi, remarked, our, our economy is the federal government. What a, what a G. So I have something to add to this. Yes. So at one point, the state of North Dakota had more missiles than any other country including <laughs> the United States so it was North Dakota, the rest of the United States, and then Russia perfect, North Dakota is there to truly save the day <laughs> so we put, we put all of our fun little toys <laughs> in North Dakota and, and when you're driving in North Dakota you just see every once in a while there's just a small little fence with a little bit of a hole in the ground and huh. security Is the security around them so bad that yeah. you can just literally just like, oh my gosh, that's fun. Alright. <laughs> I mean, there's, obvious, there's, there's oh. cameras and you can see the cameras. And, but huh. but like, there's nobody there, so like, even if they saw you, you could just there go and just like... There might be people underground. Wow. <laughs> but there's like uh, so many of them that would be expensive. I don't know. Actually, that's true. There's a lot of nuclear silence. Uh, a radical critic of U.S. policy, Mills was one of the first, or one of the first thinkers to question the effects of massive defensive spending, which he said corrupted the ruling class or power elite, who had the potential to take the country into war for the sake of corporate profit. Yet, perhaps the most famous critique of the entrenched war economy came from an unlikely source. During his farewell address to the nation in January 1961. President Eisenhower cautioned Americans against the unwarranted influence of a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions that could threaten liberties and democratic processes. 
While the conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry was fairly recent development, this military industrial complex had cultivated a total influence, which was economic, political, even spiritual, felt in every city, state house, and office of the federal government. There was, he said, great danger in failing to comprehend its grave implications. This is like a lot of extraneous information. Anyway, continue. It sure is. That's like half the textbook. Uh, <laughs> in Eisenhower's formulation, the military industrial complex referred specifically to domestic connections between arms manufacturers, members of Congress, and the Department of Defense. Yet, the new alliance between corporations, politicians, and the military was dependent on having an actual conflict wage without which there is no ultimate financial gain. To critics, military, or military industrial partnerships at home were now linked to U.S. interests abroad. Suddenly, American foreign policy had to secure foreign markets and protect favorable terms for American trade all across the globe. Seen in such a way, the Cold War was just a byproduct of America's new role as the remaining Western superpower. Regardless, the post-war rise of U.S. power correlated with what many historians describe as a national security consensus that has dominated American policy since World War II. And so, the United States was now uh, more intimately involved in world affairs than ever before. Okay, Daniel, summarize military-industrial complex. Okie dokie. So, what we got here is, um, well, as Eisenhower mentioned and other people started mentioning, they started noticing a trend that um, they started to be like working together between politicians and like military corporations or sorry, between corporations, politicians, and the military, and um, they worked together, and they didn't function well together if there wasn't a war, because nobody needed that combination without war, so that's why the United States started, like, entering into, like, not not entering into war, but, like, building up their war powers, as, like, staying as the military superpower, and as, like, keeping, like, like kind of becoming, like, the police man of the world, like, focusing it's everywhere to keep us like military bustling so, that's a terrible explanation so they were all working to... together and people yes. were worried that because they're all that, working together yeah that because they're that... all working together they just go to war just to like make money and they're like group which would like help like the corporations and politicians and military but like for like just like average people it wouldn't be good for them because they'd be dying in the wars and so like some people got like kind of worried about that okay I think I could do. I could, I could write a better textbook than this. Maybe not when <sighs> you have had two hours of sleep, but yeah. Correction, one hour, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't don't correct that. me when I make something stupid, stupid mistake like that. It's not helping your cause. It definitely is. Yeah. Somehow, ideological conflicts and independence movements erupted across the post-war. More than eighty countries achieved independence, primarily from European control. As it took center stage in the realm of global affairs, the United States played a complicated and often contradictory role in this process of decolonization. The sweeping scope of post-1945 U.S. military expansion was unique in the country's history. Critics believe that the advent of a standing army, so feared by many of the founding fathers, set a, distributing, er, a disturbing precedent. But in the post-war world, American leaders eagerly set about maintaining a new permanent military juggernaut. And creating viable international institutions. That entire paragraph so, didn't add any information. Well, yes, we, it did. We, we, we added we, a lot. We needed so to know followed. about decolonization. So basically, decolonization, yeah. or the idea so, that lots of countries got freedom from European powers. Yeah. Okay, whatever. That and also America, for the first time in history, had a standing army. So prior to this, America always like when they had a war, they had an army, and then after that, they like let the soldiers yeah, that's what go. The, that's what the past couple paragraphs were talking about. Well, I mean, it's just, it's reiterating it again, but yeah. yeah um, this textbook is so, like, ugh. It feels like some, I feel like the person who wrote this was, like, I'm on two hours of sleep. This one's a little worse than usual, yeah. yeah. This is pretty bad. It's like, uh, yeah, we're just because uh, I'm, we're all pretty tired. <laughs> yeah, maybe we're all that's exhausted because of synthesis. Yeehaw. 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 Strategy. Friday. <laughs> American strategy. American strategy. You, you missed the paragraph. I did. Oh, heck. But what if we can skip it? It's okay. We're not going to miss anything. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Roosevelt had spoken for many in his remark to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1941 that it was hard to imagine fighting a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from a backward colonial policy. Why? American post war foreign policy leaders therefore struggled to balance support for decolonization against the reality that national independence movements often pose a threat to 
America's global interests. So there's a controversy here. It's like, hey, we should probably like let these countries not be under like European control. But like, if they're not under European control, then we can't control them. And that's kind of like bad. <laughs> so like, do we want to control these countries or do we want to be chill? We can't be both. So Hi. that was the question. Hey folks. Oh, hi, yes. Man. Is it cool if I dip? Yeah. Oh, I thought you already did, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, There's like I'm two paragraphs quiet. left. Oh no. It's, it's fine. Gone. I'm not. Um, it's fine. You can leave if you but want. But I yeah. had a lovely time. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, it was fun having you, Ryan, as our guest speaker. Hopefully, you learned something cool about the Cold War and you got to hang out with the bros. Hell yeah, I did. Heck yeah, I did. Heck yeah, you did. And tomorrow in A-Push, you're going to know everything that Carpenter was talking about before he even talks about it. You're going to feel ultra smart and proud of yourself. And then yeah. you're going to feel annoyed when he gives you something to help you read the chapter. Yeah, because yeah. we already know everything. It's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of enjoy it, yeah, because like, he, like, he's talking about something like, oh, I read the entire chapter already, I know what you're doing. Yeah. And then I just kind of like bamboozle. Maybe bamboozle. if Ambrose sees that we're actually doing this a lot, and like maybe if people actually start watching it, then she will. Then people will like, like, stuff like that, stuff. yeah. yeah. No, I mean, people do watch it. Like, we got, like, 85 views on the previous live stream. That's true. We do get, like, 90 views per video. Yeah. In the so end, I think just kinda... everyone watches it by Thursday? Yeah. People, yeah. like, not everybody, because not everybody's watching it right now at 1031. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there are, like, 180 yeah. A-Push students, so it's still, like, only half. Wait, how That's many? still a lot. Only half. That's really good. Like... 180 of us? Yeah, there's, like, two Carpenter classes and three Ambrose classes. No, there's one Carpenter class and two Ambrose classes. What? Yeah, I thought there was one in third. There's only ninety nope. of us. Yeah, there's there's a third period Ambrose class, a third Ambrose class, and a first period Carpenter. Class. Oh, then there are only ninety of us. So, pretty much everybody's watching it. Then, like, what? That's, that's pretty. I dead. feel like, yeah, wow. Well, yeah, that's actually kind of cool. Like, anyways, um, let's finish this bad boy up because I need to go do math and be sad. And I need to go dinner. read that A push article. All right, oh, yeah. I have to do that also. Eugenics. Woo -woo. All right. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting trying. article. Hmm. Was it a good article? Like, um, it was a good article. I I didn't know the stuff in there, and it surprised me. And I don't know how much I like it. So yeah, that's probably the point. Without telling you much more about what it is, then you don't like it. Interesting. Yeah, I, According to Carpenter, it's like the most important thing we'll ever read in a push. So like, I have what high expectations. But that's just Carpenter and Carpenter. Rice, Carpenter. imagine. I'm talking to Rice specifically here. Imagine um, being Oh my gosh, and Rice is here. All by yourself. Yeah, Sad Rice. Imagine watching. <laughs> it sounds you know, kind you know, of hypocritical, Rice. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or did you just pop into the chat to say that? Just out of context. You pause the video immediately. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Rice, stay with us till the end. Be, be the only one of the final yeah, we've ones. We've only got like. We have like 10 minutes, like Yeah, if we stop minutes. talking, we'll be done in two minutes. Yeah. Uh, American strategy became consumed with thwarting Russian power and the concomitant global spread of communism. Concomitant? Sorry. This I is literally just English. Up. This is 100% English. Uh, foreign Naturally policy officials increasingly, <laughs> foreign policy officials increasingly opposed all insurgencies or independence movements that could be in any way linked to international communism. The Soviet Union, too, was attempting to sway the world. Stalin and his successors pushed an agenda that included not only the creation of Soviet client states in Eastern and Central Europe, but also a tendency to support left-wing liberation movements elsewhere, particularly when they espoused anti-American sentiment. As a result, the United States and this Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, engaged in numerous proxy wars in the Third World. Rice doesn't have the willpower. Rice, you're weak. <laughs> American planners felt that the successful decolonization could demonstrate the superiority of democracy and capitalism against competing Soviet models. Their goal was, in essence, to develop an informed system of world power based on as much as possible on consent rather than on coercion. Wow, that's a concept. But European powers still defended colonization, and American officials feared the anti-colonial resistance would breed revolution and push nationalists into the Soviet sphere. And when faced with such movements, American policy dictated alliances with colonial regimes, alienating nationalist leaders in Asia and Africa. What? Basically, if we feared that, go ahead. We Rice. basically, if we feared that if we didn't give other countries their freedom, then they'd become communists. Communist, and they would fight, and then they become communists. So, Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the architects of American power needed to sway the citizens decolonizing nations towards the United States. In 1948, Congress passed the Fifth Month Act. That's probably important. It's Fifth not. Month to, it's not important. Never mind. Who cares about Sorry. That? To promote <laughs> prob- a better Daniel, you're probably right it is, but... of the United States and other countries. The legislation established cultural exchange in various nations, including even the USSR, scandalous, in order to showcase American values through American artists and entertainers. The Soviets did the same, though. Uh, what they called an international peace offensive. <laughs> Why? That's like the most like military way to say being nice to other countries. International peace offensive. Yes, we are now engaging in the international peace offensive. Okay, so <laughs> we exchanged art. Yeah, literally, uh, just like art and like culture thing. stuff. Yeah, so like music and stuff like that. Oh yeah, and my mom actually told me about that. Like, she was like alive for that, and like she said that like she got the like, Beatles for the first time in the Soviet Union. Like that That's got like cool. released. And like it was extremely radical. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Why don't you uh, have a reading check on that? <laughs> honestly, after the World War Two one, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, our World War Two one was actually really fun. Our World War Two one is about women effects after World yeah. War Two. Did you and hear about our it. our reading check? Yeah, you guys got to make it up and like yeah. write about whatever you wanted. Lucky guys. Uh, the Soviets did the same. The okay, anyways. Uh, and actually, the Soviet International Peace Offensive was more successful than the American campaign. Although U.S. officials made strides through the initiation of various overt and covert programs, they still perceived that they were lagging behind the Soviet Union in the war for hearts and minds. <laughs> the war for hearts and minds. Why is this so military? We will know. force Weird. you to love us, and we will force you to think about us. Honestly, this unrest, is the weirdest section of the book. So it definitely hard. is. But this was like, I think it's like the combination of us being super tired and not. Oh, Aiden Rice wants me to read in Russian. I, can I do that, or is that not allowed? No, stop. No. Can I read? So can I read? Finish. Can I read the final section in Russian? You, you can read it's the like, conclusion. Yes, I don't. All right, read. Rice. If you stick till the end, I'm gonna read the conclusion 100% in Russian. Yes, That's just you like can, you can read the whole thing. Oh wait, there's a conclusion. Wait, wait just read the. Yeah. Image. Read the. No, no, I'll read the conclusion in Russian because nobody actually cares about the conclusion. Uh, I care about the. Conclusion. Fine, then fine. You can I'll read, read it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as black Americans fought for justice at home, prominent American black radicals, including Malcolm X, Paul Robinson, and the aging W.E.B. Du Bois, joined in solidarity. Du Bois. Du Bois. Du Bois. Du Bois. Ooh. Joined, <laughs> joined in solidarity with the global anti colonial movement, arguing that the United States had inherited the racist European imperial traditions. Supporters of the Soviet Union made their own efforts to win over countries claiming that marxist Leninist doctrines offered a roadmap for their liberation from colonial bondage. Moreover, Kremlin propaganda pointed to justice of the American South as an example of American hypocrisy. How could the United States claim to fight for global freedom when it refused to guarantee freedom to its own citizenry? In such ways, the Cold War connected the black freedom struggle, the third world, and global cold. Yeah. We're done. Chapter? We, hit, we, hit, we hit it. Right, so we are at the conclusion right now. Yeah, stay. Okay, can I read this in Russian? Yeah. All right. Actually, well, actually I feel the, bad. The images in Russian. You can just I read, can read the... the Russian image. Yeah. В стране господа бога ТФСА Соединенных Штатов. А прийти ко мне все друзья и as what the heck is happening here? Why? Wait. <laughs> oh, this is. Whoa. There is an image. Wait. This. Whoa. <laughs> That image is just... Whoa! <laughs> Wait, the, mo- the more I look at it, the more it's taking me, like... Whoa! Wait! <laughs> Wait! Understanding the Russian makes it so much worse. My god. What the heck? That's a lot. Wow. That's a, that's a lot. Hmm. Wow, alright. Anyways, a uh, conclusion. <laughs> So, am I doing conclusion in English, or am I doing the conclusion in Russian? Dude, you do whatever you want. I'll do the first paragraph in English and the second paragraph in Russian. In June 1987, American President Ronald Reagan... Oh, yes, I can do the quote. Yeehaw. Uh, President Ronald Reagan stood at the Berlin Wall and demanded that Soviet Premier Michael Gorbachev tear down this wall. Less than three years later, amid civil unrest in November 1989, East German authorities announced that their citizens were free to travel to and from West Berlin. The concrete curtain would be lifted, and East Berlin would be open to the world. Within months, the Berlin Wall was reduced to rubble by jubilant crowds, anticipating the reunification of their city and their nation, which took place on October 3, 1990. By July 1991, the Warsaw Pact had crumbled. 
and on December 25th of that year, the Soviet Union was officially dissolved. Hungary, 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 Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, were freed from Russian dominance. Um, that's debatable, but sure. <laughs> All right, and now finally, the bonus Jonas of me reading in Russian. You didn't read the second paragraph. Well, I'm reading that one in Russian. Oh, okay, sick. Unless I'm not allowed to no, do so. I... Are you just gonna translate it to Russian? Yeah, on the fly. Oof. Okay, good luck. Oh shoot, actually this is gonna be kinda hard. Okay, uh... Ooh, this is gonna be hard. Uh, partisan uh, uh... Ooh, this is gonna be hard. Wait. Uh... <laughs> uh... I'm just gonna throw it into Google Translator because I don't have the brain power to translate. Is still here. <laughs> it's important. There's only three people watching it right now, so if we're all watching it, then. He's well, it's, no, it said that it's. I'm not rushing. I'm not watching it anymore. Yeah. Uh. Okay, you ready? You guys ready for this? This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's see how terrible this translation is. Okay. Boom. Alright, but it, oh, that's terrible. Partisans боролись за то, чтобы взять на себя ответственность за распад Советского Союза и окончание холодной войны. Будет это триумфальная риторика и милитаристское давление консервативов или внутреннее разрушение окосневших бюрократов и работа российских реформатов, которые своим сформировали окончание холодной войны. Вопрос более поздних десятилетий. Вопросы об окончании холодной войны должны быть представлены, а, приоставлены, приостановлены до того, как они оценят последствия холодной войны в стране и за рубежом. Измеренное десятками миллионов людей, погибших в конфликтах, связанные с холодной войной, в перестройке американской политики и культуры или в преобразовании роли Америки в мире, холодная война подтолкнула американскую историю на новый путь, который она еще а, имеет еще не статься. Nice. That was like a 70% accuracy, but Rice, Rice, I read it for you. He, Why? he shamed you for using Google Trans. Rice, that hurts. My brain's working up two hours of sleep. Take that back. I need that. <laughs> I'll cry on live. Actually, no, I won't cry on live. That's too low for me. Okay. I'm fine. So we did it, in. guys. And then... Well, guys. This is the next job. Yeah, next time, hopefully, we'll be streaming at the right time, and we'll have the entire DJ two on, and hopefully, we'll not all be asleep deprived. And maybe the chapter won't great. be as bad. I'm just yeah, this blame chapter was absolutely it terrible. That. Yeah, that's what it was. Go get I'm some sleep over spring break, everyone. Yeah, and then too. it's Corona time. It's or, Corona time. Wow. Yeah. Don't. I don't actually don't. Oh my gosh! All Matteo and Rice are here. Yeah, I don't know if Rice is still here. Actually, he might. Rice be. just said no. no a second ago. Dude, he's totally still here. Let's go, Rice. Let's go, Rice. Let's go, Amatil. All right. Amatil is the real one. Amatil was here, very beginning to the real end. And you know what? We need to have like an appreciation. Amatil is. Amatil. Yeah, he's the VIP. Amatil is the VIP. Stream. Actually, have they been at every stream? Yes, Amatil has been at every single stream for the entirety of each stream. That's that's pretty awesome. I mean, Estrella has been at every other stream, and I know Max stayed for the entirety of last stream. Yeah, you know what, Amatil? That's, that's pretty cool. Good job, Amatil. We, we, we appreciate you. Alright, goodbye, All right, people. I have to go to bed. It's late. Oh my god. Good yeah, night. it's past Josh's bedtime. Yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs>